Beers and Steinberg. You know what the f it is? Aries and Andy, you and the jerk. You know it's time to get this work. The real raw, gutter, uncut No political corrections. Always sleep. Being awoke. We discuss politics and jokes. Cry, we lick. There's levels to this Before you was on your mama's. Airy Spears don't give a fuck. We talk about race a lot, racism, sexism. Much love to my loyal bag holders, rollers, loaders. We got them in the folders. The whole world on our shoulders. Spears and Steinberg. Yeah. Canada, oh Canada. <laughs> Listen, by the time you guys hear this, it will be Wednesday. I will be in New York, and I will be doing press at WPIX News, The Breakfast Club, Hot 97, all in promotions for The Garden. I won't be with you. No, you won't. I'm going to be home. I'm right? not, no, I'm gonna oh, stay you'll in, be in Toronto. I'm going to stay in Toronto for a couple of days. Tara's going to come out. We're just going to hang out for a little bit. She, she got there today. Did she? She's in Toronto today. She went to the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, museum or something like that. Uh, so, but so everybody knows, as you said, you are listening to this on Wednesday, the seventeenth of April. On the nineteenth, two days later, folks, uh, we're going to be at Cleveland Improv. That's the uh, Cleveland Improv, unless it's the Cleveland Funny Bone. Say it. What? Cleveland. Say it. Cleveland Improv. No, what we always say. You want me to say it? What? Yes. Oh, Aries, do you need anything? Yeah, to get the f out of. <laughs> but we're going to be there We're going to be there Friday the 19th Through uh, Sunday the 21st And the reason I'm bringing this up Is I want everybody that's in Ottawa To hear us say that Saturday the 27th of April We're going to be at Bronson Center Theater in Ottawa Followed by the Olympia in Montreal On Sunday the 28th Taking a day off Which we need I, I found out that if you get on a plane every day As you're doing this it, it, That's what beats you up More so than I think anything else Especially if you don't get a nice amount of sleep. Sleep, yeah. yeah. And then you're up and out the next day. Yeah. So we're taking that Monday the 29th off, and then we're on the 30th. We're going to be at Halifax in Nova <clears throat> Scotia at the Bellarose Art Center. And uh, the following week, that weekend, we end up at uh, uh, Portland Helium. And that is Thursday, May 2nd through May 5th. We'll be out there. And then we'll get you the rest of the dates at the end of the show. But I just wanted to throw out the, the quick ones that are coming up. And, of course, you want to tell them to hit like and subscribe, right? Always hit like and subscribe. Yes. See? Okay, let's get into it because we got some nice appetizers before we get to the meat and potatoes. And the meat is very meaty and the potato is very potato-y. <laughs> before we, uh, when we started this thing, uh, our first stop was in Edmonton, Canada. Then the next night, we were in Calgary. Calgary. Uh, got off to a little bit of a rough start for me, but there was a blessing in the roughness. Um, I, call, I, I called Andy and, and told him, and it was killing me because I wanted to tell him so bad. Oh, I'm finally going to get to hear this. Yes. Oh, and and, and I said, right. I want to save it for the pod because I just want everything to be fresh. So I was supposed to catch my flight at like 6 in the morning. My goal was to leave my house at 3.55 a.m., I ended up dozing off somewhere around midnight, and you know, Andy knows, uh, <clears throat> I don't like to sleep in complete darkness, so I leave the light on downstairs, and I sleep with the TV on. So around one, just after one o'clock, I woke up to complete blackness, and I just thought, oh, the, the TV must have just turned itself off, or whatever, because the cable does that sometimes. So I, before I could even realize to, to turn the TV on, I go, wait a minute, why is... All the lights off. The power went out in my house. Um, so I was like, dude, what am I going to do? I, I'm not going to stay here in darkness. I'm not going to go get a hotel room for like two hours. So I might as well go to the airport. But this was three hours before I had planned to. So I had to manually open my garage door, take my truck out, leave the house. You know, uh, turn the, I couldn't even turn the alarm on because there was no power. So I leave, I'm pissed, I get to the airport, I get to the shuttle uh, garage, and I end up uh, sleeping in my truck, because uh, I didn't, didn't want to go to the airport and just be sitting there for a couple hours, so I decided to sleep in my truck for a couple hours. So I'm pissed about the whole experience. Uh, so then I go to the Air Canada, I get my ticket, and as I'm walking past the first line, priority line, uh, I look and I see one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I'm looking at this girl and I'm going, oh my God, she's gorgeous. 
But then I stopped. I went, whoa, wait, actress? She goes, and she beams this million dollar megawatt smile, beautiful teeth. She goes, yeah. I go, Paula Patton? She goes, yes. Andy, <laughs> I go, Miss Patton, I don't mean to bother you, but I have to tell you, you are one of the most beautiful human beings on the planet. And she couldn't have been sweeter, Andy. She was diabetic sweet. She went, oh my God, thank you. So I'm tripping from the time I leave her sight till I'm going through security. And, and for those of you who don't know, and for those of you who do know, I've mentioned this woman on this pod before. I said between uh, who, when she played opposite Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, I forget which one it was. I think it was five. Um, and the movie she was in with Denzel and Mark Wahlberg, where she was Denzel's woman and she gets killed in the movie. I said, Paula Patton is one of the most beautiful women. Her bone structure, her eyes, her, her oh, I love, beautiful. So I'm walking through security and, 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 I'm kind of hoping in the back of my mind that she's going to walk through security. And sure enough, as, I already, as I'm already, already going through the x-ray machine, I see her coming. I go, I got to do it. I, I, I got to do it. So I go, Miss Pat, now I'm sorry. I, I don't mean, and again, when I say this woman is so sweet, I mean, everybody that talked to her, she just, the smile, dude. Uh, she's very earthy. Um, I go, Miss Patton, can I please get a picture with you? And she goes, of course. So as I'm getting ready to take the picture, I go, I, I know this might be tacky, but I got to let you know, I'm a little famous too. My, I'm, I'm a comedian. She stops me and goes, Aerie Spears. I go, yeah. She goes, I thought I recognized you. <sighs> Andy, I never thought about cheating on my woman harder. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is, man. Uh, is this the pick? Boom. Wow. Boom. At what time in the morning is this? Uh, this is, uh, uh, by the time we go, it's like four something. So four something in the morning, she still looks like that. Dude. Now here's what I will say though. As much as I have a crush on this woman, body wise, she's not my type. Too thin for you. Too thin. The legs are, are nice, but they're not like my girl. Yo, she 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 did adobo and sofrito and plantains. It shows <laughs> the thigh meat, the leg, the ass. This woman's body is very and she's mixed, and you can see where she got the the black woman light skin skin tone. But as far as the extras, nah, son. But you said the most amazing person. She was she was she was a great person. Very so earthy, very fucking nice, and sweet. So that's that. That's that's awesome, uh, dude. I I I wouldn't have thought in a million years that I would meet her, especially like that. So if I had, if it wasn't for the blackout, I'd have missed that opportunity. See? Damn, the blackout, the blackout. That's the name of this. I like it. The blackout. Through darkness came light. So that was the, that was the uh, that made it all worthwhile. That's, oh man, son! That's why you weren't in a bad mood about it. No. Oh, that woman is so goddamn beautiful. Um, so that's a very nice start to the trip. Do you want to tell them what happened on the way to get to uh, Syracuse? Uh, well, <laughs> well, you want to jump that far ahead? Listen, man, then, uh, you, you don't have to. I got it. No, we don't. No, I'm we, I got issues with Canada because uh, once upon a time ago. Um, and I know I told this story in the pod, so I'll tell it again quickly. Uh, I, I got I, we 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 landed somewhere, and it was one of those things where they said you could get off the plane because you're going to come back on this same plane to get to your final destination. And I forget the exact details, but I got off the plane, and I was trying to get back on the plane, and a flight attendant was giving me a hard time, and basically I pushed past her, so I made physical contact. And pushed past this. I got arrested in Chicago. Uh, uh, spent the night in jail. Um, and I think that was on my record. And then for some reason, and we talked about it in the car, 
DUIs. Yeah. When I got arrested for a DUI back in 2000, well, I forget what year it was. I think it was 2009, uh, 16 or whatever it was. That stays with you for some reason. And the weird thing is everywhere else, anytime else I've left the country, Europe, Africa, never a problem. Why is this a problem with Canada? You, you better off like killing someone. Jesus. Serving your time, and then you can go to Canada. But if you get a DUI, man, they're gonna it flags you every time. So when I got to Edmonton and I had to go through um, immigration, and, and listen, I, I, I have this lawyer that I went through the last time I was in Canada. I can't remember when. And so basically, she got me all this paperwork. I did all the legal things I needed to do so I could have, air quotes, no problems whenever I come to Canada. So I got this packet about this thick with all the shit my lawyer gave me and said, this will prevent you from any problems. And I, when, you, when I go to the you know, immigration booth, they always go, okay, we see this, this, and this on the computer. Now you got to go to this room. So I go to the room. The one guy looks at the packet and he goes, yeah, I'm going to have to go through this page by page. So then he goes to me, yeah, you need to probably call the airline and have them rebook you uh, on a later flight. Tell them you're with us, and they'll rebook you to get on a flight and like the next flight, which is probably in a couple hours. And I go, well, now I'm risking possibly missing my gig if I can't, if this thing doesn't work out timing-wise. So I'm, I'm starting to kind of sweat a little bit, and I'm going, what the f*** is the point of this packet if this is going to still happen? So I called the lawyer. She didn't pick up at the time. Uh, she's back in L.A., the time difference. I called my, my, my business manager. He ends up being able to reach her, and she was going to call and iron things out. But here's the funny thing, and, and this is why I go, man, being famous is the blessing and the curse. Because, and I've had this happen to me several times when I go through Canada. Mad TV was big in Canada. Uh, and among, you know, their big comedy fans, so many of the other agents there, especially three or four of the women, was going, that's Harry Spears, that's it. They were getting excited. Cut to one of the ladies who's the agent calls me over and she goes, you're good. And I'm going, am I good because you looked through the packet and saw what you needed to see or am I good because I'm Harry Spears? Both. You had the packet and you're Harry Spears and she just wasn't going to make you miss the flight. And I'm going to tell you something. And note to black people, and I'm not, please, I hope none of them, none of y'all take this this way, even though I know some of you will. Man, I don't want this to come off like I'm kowtowing fear of the white man. But when you deal with authority, being an asshole can never help you. Even when you know you're dealing with an asshole. Like the guy, the first guy who had no idea who I was. And listen, I was getting upset because I'm thinking, oh my God, I got to rebook. What if I miss my gig? Da, 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 da. And the whole rebooking process. If I would have gave that dude attitude, he holds the power. He could go, oh, you being a Yeah, let me read slow through every page. And, and I'm just saying that to say that sometimes black folks, when we deal with authority, the police, and we can smell racism or asshole it's not a sign of weakness to be smart it's not a weakness to go let me not be the bigger asshole than this guy even though i know he's in the wrong because how does that benefit you well it, it the only the thing that i was going to say is if you can clearly be calm when someone else is being an asshole and someone goes what's the situation here it's going to be obvious to somebody else the one was an asshole and one wasn't. Not always, but right. it should work out that way. Right. So it's it's good that you uh, maintain that. What that one time when you pushed past the lady, it it caused that big of a stir. Look at this, like assault. Wow. You made contact aggressively, and you're black. Yes, yeah. And you know they say you threaten any TSA agent oh, or yeah, flight yeah. person. That's serious. Well, even like in in in. Uh, New York now, it's a big like the 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 people on the subways, yeah, and the the, the conductors on the subways, whatever. And you better not talk to them. You better not talk to them cross. You, you right. got because uh, they they've been assaulted by people now, right? And so they're they're cracking down on that hard. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So then cut to uh, uh, Edmonton, which was great. 
Calgary, which was great. I love staying at the casinos. I, I won a couple uh, couple thousand dollars at uh, computer poker. Um, but uh, and before I, we get off this, let me say this: the one thing that really bothers me, and this is why I go. This is what's great about America. Even though I will say, America, we there are some casino. There are a lot of casinos in America that are guilty of the same thing. So let, let me not make this seem like this is strictly Canadian, but. This is why Vegas is the king of casinos. And, and, and Atlantic City is its, you know, perfect side bitch. In those casinos, when you play at the tables, you're allowed to smoke at the casinos. And of course, they and of course the alcohol is free, because the more drugged up, drunk up you are, the more you like the more likely you are to make financial stupid decisions <laughs> and burn through your money, which is what they want. So I'm at the casino. But I'm going, dude, if you're a smoker, when you gamble and you're drinking, drinking and smoking go together like shitting and pissing. They just go together. And you're winning and you get the rush and you're feeling good. And even if you're not winning and you're depressed, well, then you definitely want to smoke and drink. But I'm, I'm, I'm at this casino and, and roulette is my game. Me and Andy gambled, uh, played roulette at the Edmonton casino the night before. And they allowed you to drink and smoke in it. That's the River Creek. River and, Creek. In a special, in, they have a room for it. They have an area for it. Yeah, they have an area for it. In this place, they had an area for it too, but it was in the high limits where there's nothing but card tables. There's no roulette. So the guy goes, yeah, only in the high limit room can you smoke. And I'm just going, this is the dumbest. How, who, you're in a casino. This is Disneyland for adults. This is gambling. That is the dumbest. And I know, again, in America, there are other than Vegas and uh, Atlantic City, I don't know of any casinos in America where you can go and gamble and smoke. They don't allow you to smoke. That's why I have a casino then. You know, uh, so this is this is why, because I don't smoke. And I love when I come back and my clothes don't smell like smoke. I, I, I'm still fresh. Well, then they should make a room for y'all. Not the other way around. I, I'm not going to. However you want it to go, I, I don't care, because you're right. Once, once, once you break out the vices... Why, why are you stopping it? Why are you leaving one out? Yes. You gambling, drinking, smoke. All of it's bad. So you might, you, uh, so I'm not disagreeing with you. They should allow like you to f- bitch on the table. Well, how did you feel about them taking cigarettes out of, uh, or smoking out of the comedy clubs? You know, that was before my time. Okay. But it, I can tell you this. I, I wish they would bring it back. Because, again, there's, there's something to me very nostalgic, old school, rugged comedy. Tell me about people that can sit back and when you see that smoke illuminate in the stage light, that just feels so old school. That that's what's missing, and and I and I, I'm very happy that I can leave a comedy club and my clothes smell without smoke. No, I'm I'm happy right. with that. But at the same time, when I watch videos, man, there was something about when you watch an old video mm-hmm. and you see that smoke just right. coming up and yeah, you that lighting and that whole look of everything. Yeah, there's something about that that's missing. Yes. Um, and, you know, here's the thing I said, too. At one point, I was on stage uh, in, in, in Calgary, and I had a slip of the tongue, and I kind of said something about, I, I, I alluded to, I'm in, I'm in America. And all a lot of Canadian people went, Canada! They're reminding me, you're in Canada! And I go, and I meant this because I said this to Andy. I go, yo, there are certain parts... When you look at the major metropoli- metrop- metropolitan cities like Vancouver and Toronto, you'll forget you're in Canada. Even in these smaller cities, there's certain similarities between uh, Canadians and Americans where you don't, you know, f- you forget you, you're not in America. And I go, but nothing reminds me I'm American than as a smoker than when I buy Canadian cigarettes. <laughs> you put death on the boxes. I love that they do that, though. In America, yes, it says on the box in words, this is hazardous to your health and danger. But in, when you buy Canadian cigarettes, like Patrice said, y'all put dead babies on the box. They show pictures of people with stage four cancer dying on the box. up lungs and, and throat cancer and tongue can- mouth cancer. And I'm going, how is this good for business? That'd be like if you went to a restaurant and you look in the menu and there's pictures of dead fat that all died of heart attacks next to the food choices. How is that good for business? 
Um, it's not, but they're trying to decrease that business. They don't want everybody smoking. I asked the I, cigarette I, people don't want people smoking the product. No, the cigarette people do, but the people who run the the country they don't want smoking. I, I love. I asked you what brand of cigarettes are you, and you go, they're just cigarettes. But they're they're, they're dead baby cigarettes. Yeah, they should be. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, cancer stage four. And their cigarettes. cigarettes are shorter too. Yeah, they don't want you smoking as long. <sighs> I uh, I thought the box was interesting, dude. I really did. I'd like to. I'm gonna next when we go back up there. I'm gonna get like I'll just grab some empty box. I, brought, I still got a box in my bag. I should have brought it. Man, I think those are the it, that is the weirdest thing. But it is it 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 gets the point across. Now, flash forward to uh, we got to now leave uh, Canada to come to Syracuse, do two sh- uh, do three shows in two nights, and then fly to Toronto uh, tomorrow. Um, We're driving out to Toronto. Oh, driving out yeah. to Toronto. Um, but we had to take three flights. We had to go from Calgary to Minneapolis, Minneapolis to Detroit, Detroit to Syracuse. So the moment we're walking up to the gate, <laughs> to, to, to the gate to go to uh, from here to from Detroit to Syracuse. Three gates away from where we landed. From where we landed. I go to Andy, man, this trip has been so smooth. You know, if we get delayed, we're and Andy kind of just shook his head and didn't say nothing. But everything's on schedule. Cut to the plane that landed, that, that we're going to get on, that let the people off. I'm going, oh, there's no problem. The plane's here. All I got to do is do the cleanup. Dude, we're, we're good. Cut to there's a maintenance issue with the fucking tire. The flight is delayed to the point where I'm calling the manager from the club and going, oh, man, what, what? Because my thing is, all three shows are sold out. This is a lot of money, and this is a lot of merch. And if one of these shows get blown because of this, that's money and merch that's gone. So I'm like, Lord, don't, please don't. And it cut it close, so much so that we got on the flight, but we couldn't even go to the hotel and shower up. We had to go straight to the club. They had to start the show uh, late, put up a, a local dude to kind of fill in the time. And it was a rush job, but by the grace of the Lord, we made it. it. It worked out, but I mean, I seriously walked in, and as soon as we walked in with the manager and Ari standing next to me, he goes, how soon can you go on? I go, I have to take a piss. And, and then I, as, I'm fin- as I'm zipping up, they're introducing me. So much so that you almost forgot to take your shirt. Yeah. I, and I had to yeah, remind yeah, you yeah, to yeah. Take, grab your all-day-long yeah, shirt. Yeah. I grabbed my stuff, and I went on stage. It, it, it was that quick. It was boom. Uh, and then we, were, we had two shows, so I didn't check in probably until like, one o'clock, I, and uh, they go. Uh, the manager's dropping me off, and he goes, "Hey, you shouldn't have a problem checking in." He just thought about it. I mean, no one thought about it, but I, right. I thought about it on the drive over. I go, "I'm going to call and make sure that they know we're coming. Yeah, so they don't cancel our, re- our reservations." So yeah, everything worked out. It was it's it was good shows last night. Syracuse, we had the the show tonight, and uh, then we're jumping on that in in the car, and we're driving up to uh, Toronto, and one show out there. So it, it's been a swing, but. And those one nighters where you actually have to be somewhere the next day, yeah. When you don't have a day in between, oh, those beat you up. Yeah, and plus, again, we we didn't get much sleep. And listen, I like I said, I played uh, computer poker and didn't get to bed till three in the morning, and I had to be up at five. So I was really feeling it. That's why. That's why by the time I got done last night uh, with the two shows here in Syracuse, I went to TGI Fridays, threw a couple back, got some food. That, that bed hit me, my. And I was like, let's push the podcast an hour. Dude, if I would have went and had anything to drink last night, yeah. I would have fallen asleep at TGI Fridays. <laughs> I, w- I would have, because as soon as I got here, I was I was done. I was ready to go. Right. I took a shower just because we hadn't really got right. a chance to clean up. I took a shower, and I almost fell asleep in the shower. I went like that, and I was like, I, I, I got to get out of here. Well, just know as a teammate, if you ever get that tired and do decide to have a drink and you're about to fall out, I'm going to hold you in my arms like <laughs> Pippa did Jordan. <laughs> just so you know. I, I, I appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> um, I want to jump back a little bit. So the one gig Andy didn't do with me uh, at the Parker Center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, which was great and fun. Um, Neri, uh, I asked, because I wanted Neri to do it since uh, Andy couldn't do it. And Nary couldn't do it, so he, he he brought in a guy that he recommended named Ricky Cruz, who was who was good. Uh, shout out to Ricky Cruz. And uh, afterwards, 
Neri and I got into a little bit of a text thing. Because, uh, and, and keep in mind, listen, I know I can be a, a brute at times, but I'm also an underrated nice guy. And, and, I, and I appreciate Andy because he stuck up for me in that way. I'm one of, he said, and it's true, I think I'm one of the most misunderstood people. Um, but the reason why I said once upon a time ago when Neri wanted to do a podcast, and we tried it, but I, I, I just felt my gut was, me and Aunt Neri are like two alpha wild bears. And I don't think either one of us, with a certain sense of ego and pride, know how to take a step back. And I think for something to work really well at times, you have to have a yin and a yang, which is why so many people go, yo, you and... Andy, y'all's chemistry, because we have a yin and a yang. When 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 he's when he when I'm rawr, 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 he's you know what I mean? Where me and Neri are two tornadoes. And I can feel where sometimes Neri put, tries to throw his dick on the table, and that ain't gonna make me do nothing but throw my dick on the table harder. And we get combative. So at one point, Neri asked me, and, and I'm saying that to say that I'm saying that to say this. He started this, all right? But I'm gonna finish the. So he goes, uh, did you dig Ricky? I go, he's cool. Not as good as you, but he's cool. Now, that's a compliment, is yeah. it not? Yeah. So Neri goes, yeah, man, he's a cool ass dude. Uh, you can't get on him for not being as good as me. You ain't even as good as me. And I go, LOL, you couldn't even believe that in your dream. And he goes, don't worry, bro. You're my dude. One day you'll be as good as me. Now, this is all tongue in cheek. Uh, and I go, yeah, because club theaters and going overseas can't compete with cruise ship training. P.S. You my guy too. Uh, say hi to the fam. He goes overseas on the sea. Same, same. I go, no, sir. Performing uh, for mostly vacationers on a cruise ship who are from the United States is not the same thing as performing for locals in a different country. When you're ready to level up, you let me know. I'm here for you, boo-boo. And he goes, performing for people who go online, buy tickets ahead of time, get a sitter, drive to the club, go into the theater knowing exactly who they are about to watch because they are fans of the person is, and he puts in caps, much easier than making people laugh when they have even... Uh, when they he meant to say when they don't even know what show is about to go down, much less who the comic is, and even less are fans of them. Make people laugh that didn't even know who you are laugh while they're on a vacation after being out in the sun all day. Then get at me. When I go to the improv, now it's like taking a test with the answers. Easy peasy. Now before I continue, I've asked Neri this question. I even asked Ricky Cruz this question this night. And I told Andy, yo, I've been doing this 35 years. I still get nervous, dude. But once I tell my first couple jokes and get to laugh, it's like, uh-oh, I, I dropped my first couple jumpers. Now I'm relaxed. Now I'm in my rhythm. I'm backpedaling, tongue wagging like Jordan. I'm about to put up 40. But I'm nervous. And I remember I asked Neri one time, we were doing the... Um, uh, What's the place? Not Fort Lauderdale. West, West Palm. West Palm. We're doing a West Palm improv. And now Neri's lost all his weight. But before, Neri used to like eat in between. Like once he gets it with his, done with his set, or even before he does his set, this nigga eats. And I go, dude, how do you put food on a nervous system? You don't get nervous with the extreme amount of confidence. Nah. Okay. I go to Ricky before. I said, dude, you, you ever get... And, 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 and the Parker Center probably did about a 1,000 people. And, you know, I go, Ricky, you, you, ever, you ever get nervous? Nah, man, this is easy. And I go, well, that must explain why I'm better than you. You need to be nervous. Because this much confidence, and, and you're just... Not I, but be ner- like, damn. And I listen, I'm, I know that... I don't, I don't know for sure, but I'm going... Maybe, you know, maybe you don't have to be nervous to be great. Dave Chappelle probably don't get nervous. Eddie Griffin, with his bravado, seems like he don't get nervous. So I don't want to make it seem like that, but damn. You know, I thought about this because we talked about this yesterday. And I don't really get that nervous. I get some butterflies. I get that excitement, that nervous energy when I'm about to go up, but not nervous. You know what I mean? I get excited, that excited nervous energy. But I thought about it. And I was thinking about this today, actually, because and I didn't know we were going to talk about this. Uh, I know if I was you, I would get nervous. And this is why. This is the difference that 
he do, that he doesn't have in in his description, and that I don't have, and that Ricky uh, Ricky Cruz doesn't have. And let me just say this: if you go on where I think you're going with this, I'm gonna listen to you. I'm gonna stop you only because I think what you're about to say, we we address this. Okay. So, and I want to I want to get through it and then have you go. But go ahead. But go ahead because I might be wrong. Because my name isn't on the marquee. Okay. Can I stop you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. So when he goes easy peasy. I, I, again, I'm like, all right, nigga, you you throwing your weight around like you know, easy peasy. But I guess that's just who you are. Anyway, so I go, nigga, please. We all, oh, because because remember what he just said about not being nobody. I go, please. We all start out under those beginning conditions. Yeah. No one is born famous or successful. You earn your stripes and you don't look back. You're not supposed to stay under the same conditions to which you started out. Be careful, cadet. You're talking to a general. So then he goes, that's cute. You were 50. And now this is the part where I got a little pissed off. You were 15 when you started. People gave you a pass just because of the novelty of seeing a kid up there. You funny as I wasn't taking a shot at you. I was saying that performing for an audience that knows who and what they are going to see is so much better and easier for the performer than when no one knows or plans to see a show. That's just facts, I think. Not a shot at you or me or any person. That's a commentary on how performing under certain conditions makes it more enjoyable to others. And this was my last rebuttal. I said, first of all, nobody gave me a pass at anything. I did Showtime at the Apollo at 17 when them Harlem, New York don't give a fuck who you, who you are about your youth. They booed a young female named Lauren Hill. Secondly, we both know what it's like to start out and not be famous. And we both had to go through everything you said. We both understand that experience. But what you don't understand is the experience of being famous and successful on this level and having to live up to that. So some would say my condition is probably harder than easier because you get to live in anonymity. While I have to wear my failures and success in the public eye, it's one thing if you suck on a cruise ship. It's another if you do it at Madison Square Garden. Oh, wait. You wouldn't know that because you've never performed at the Garden five times. You should try and step your game up on all levels before you speak from a place of inexperience. I've done what you've done. You have yet to do what I've been doing for 35 years. And don't worry, I don't see this as you taking a shot. Anytime you have a, you and I have shared the same, sta same stage, you've opened for me, not the other way around. The undercard don't never take a shot at the main event. So come on, man. Like, earn your stripes. I've been through your stage. You ain't been through my stage. Yeah, but there's 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 some places that you miss, but I don't think it affects that. That's not what this this story is about. Uh, and actually, the stuff that you missed would have benefited you. Uh, I know so, what you so, 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 so you're, stuff you you're, yeah. So you're not you're not even coming with that. So it, it's been to your disadvantage, not to your advantage. Is right. what I was going to say. I'm uh, sorry, I pulled a LeBron James. Yeah, even though I prefer to be MJ. Yeah, straight out of high, high school. school. But. Um, I'll say that uh, if if your name's on there, you you do you. They paid their money to see you, and so and I, and I addressed this at the beginning. You don't you know you sh sit there, shut the f up. You didn't pay for this anyway. I, I, I that's why I don't have the nerves. I don't have to walk into a room, and I'm going to be really honest. And you've done this, and, and you know, and uh, especially as we were coming out of the pandemic, and people weren't coming out, and we show up at a show, and the room's half. And you still have to. You got to go out there, and you get you're you're ju you have to judge yourself by how many people actually came out to see you as well. Right. And I mean that's 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 another thing. And you got to go to the, you got to go to the club owner or manager uh, at the end of the weekend. And you have there's a lot of details in there that no one's thinking about. If if you sold out, if you sold out, you're a star to them. You you so they booked you because you're a star. If you sell out, you're a star to the owner. If you don't sell out, you're 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 another comedian. And you you put on good shows, but there's levels to this, and that's a level that, as an as someone that works with someone who does that, I don't have to do that. I'm not participating in that. Why should I be nervous? I should be able to eat a pizza and take a shit before my set. It doesn't affect me the same way. You have all that to think about. You have to think about everything from the beginning to the end and everything in between. And I don't think people un understand that. And then you have people that will come in because they do know you and purposely be. No one's, you know, when you say that you don't have to, I don't, I'm not saying purposely, but if they don't enjoy what you're doing or they don't like it or they might have heard that, the, the, I, yell out some shit 
or say something or ruin a joke because they're, not, because they're excited and they're not even thinking about that. You have to deal with the excited person that doesn't mean to be f***ing up your set, but is so excited to see you, they're f***ing up your show. And that's because you're famous and because they bought the ticket. I don't have that. The only thing I have is that people don't like me because I'm not you. They want to get to you. And I, I'm in the way of that. And so I, I, I'm i just the guy in the way. So I have to be funny. And it's nice when the crowd likes me. But if they don't like me, no one's talking about that. Oh, they may say it, that opener sucked. But you know what's the greatest thing about when they say the opener sucks? They don't even know your name. So I don't have to worry about Andy Steinberg sucked. I just did the opener sucked. Well, what you do also have to worry about, and I noticed this last night, and I've noticed this before, but I noticed it last night. When you do the bit now where you talk about not saying the N-word, but thinking yeah. it, there was a group of black women just yo I, yo, I saw that. Right. At one point, and she kept chirping a little bit when you would say certain things. You know, they call it the, the, the isms. Yeah, mm-hmm, the show, mm-hmm. But at one point, the moment you opened up with, I'm not going to say the N-word, she, she, she goes, you bet not. And as you continue to get into the explain the joke before you got to the punchline, her expression, the way she moved, she was so immediately closed off to like, damn, with your ghetto ass, free yourself and allow yourself to intercept what could be a great joke. Don't be so quick to be closed minded and turned off off the first three words you heard. But see that 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 I enjoy that in a way because what happens is is I love that people go to a certain place and if the joke is good enough it takes them out of that place or sometimes it doesn't sometimes they stay right where they are but that isn't on me and that's I love comedy I love comedy for that reason comedy is 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 a skill set it really is if you have a weak comedy muscle you're not going to get strong jokes you're not going to appreciate them for what they are because you your comedy muscle is weak but if you build up your comedy muscles. And and you and you're willing to be open to listening to something because I love talking about horrible. Shit. I mean, and, and, and you know, to the effect, the reverse is because they don't know you, they'll be quicker to be turned off. Yes, because they know me, they'll give me the shot. Yeah. But then after I say the joke, they might be turned off. Yeah, but it, we all have our we all have different scenarios on stage. But I, to what you know, Neri said and what you said, and, and there's there's more truth in the fact that everyone starts off there. We've already done that part. We we're already doing this part. You had to excel past that, and you had to make. And the other part that Neri isn't going to get on this, and this is way different. You have uh, you have maintained your credibility in comedy this whole way through. It's not easy to do that. It's not easy to continue to sell tickets. It's not easy to, for people to come out and see you. Even the best of comics, they they wane. Very few comics. That's what makes them legends. Is when they stay in that area that they're relevant in comedy. Most people are relevant for a short period of time throughout their career. And the rest of the time, they're, they're, they're off of what they have done. Very few people will stay relevant. Right. So, you know, there, there's a lot to it. And, you know, but uh, ego, is, ego, is a, ego is one of the things that you have to, you know, wonder. And, you know, like, there's times when I'm working with you, and I think something I said is funny that night. And I go, that's the funniest thing that was said tonight. Am I right or wrong? I don't know. But I, I think it might have been the funniest thing said that. But, I, but my ego doesn't need to be, I don't need to tell you that I thought what I said tonight, that night was funnier than anything else that was said that night. I don't know if that's even true. I'm just using it as, as an example. But I'm just saying, I don't have that in me. Uh, I'm funny based on what the people saw, saw and left with. Did they take anything with them? That's all that I'm concerned with. Did they, li- did they see me? Was, was I funny? And did they take anything that I said with them home? Right. And that, uh, all this other shit that people get or get uh, into comedy and competition. Comedy isn't a competition the same way sports are. I can go and say, hey, I can lift this amount. Can you lift this amount? Okay, no, I'm stronger but than you. Don't, but, you but, but honestly, I, you don't believe that most com- comedians are competitive in a way? Oh, yeah. They're competitive. But when you come to the realization that this is you're, you're giving. Comedy is something you don't keep. You give. So if I'm giving it to them and they're taking it home, uh, I, what you're basically saying is whose president was more likable that night then? What you gave out, what was more likable? Did you give the best gift? Yeah. Right. And I, I'm not saying, listen, they paid for you. They sh- when they leave your show, if they don't feel that you brought the best gift, then they feel like they got f***ed out of their 35 or 47 or whatever dollars they spent that night. You better come with it. 
But he, uh, he's, um, he said it in there, when they don't know you and their expectations, and they don't, the only thing we don't get as an opener, I believe, is when people come and they don't know you, so their expectations are negative. They're, they start off negative. So you, your bar isn't as high. But the thing that you don't get, you don't get trust. And that's, that's the funny thing for me because opening in front of you and being different than you, and I like talking about horrible situations and they don't know me. They don't trust me sometimes. And sometimes I have to get them and say certain things to show them that this is going to be okay and I'm not going to leave you in a bad spot. No matter how horrible this joke is about to sound, I'm going to make sure that I twist it and bring you back so you can see it from my perspective. That's the hardest thing for me. I think that's the hardest thing for a comic that doesn't isn't known is that you don't get the trust and you just come up there and you're, you're doing your jokes that you think are funny. You don't know anybody's personal experiences. You don't know what they're going through and you have to bring them into your world. That's the hard part. But competing between each other and, and Neri saying those, those things, I understand where he's coming from, but it's unnecessary. To me, this is unnecessary. Yeah, that's why I'm just saying like I, and again, I started off with a compliment. I said, hey, I like dude, but he's not as good as you. And he went and went, well, let me playfully jab at you. Well, now I got to playfully shoot you. Well, but if he was meaning it to be funny, then, you know, did you take it? Did you, did you, you know? If it, I, it, it, to me, it, it bothered me when he said the thing about me getting a pass. Like the novelty of a kid. Like I'm a novelty. Like, no, dude, I was doing Indigo Blues, Triveca, Terminal D, Peppermint Lounge. In East Orange, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, Queens, Long Island. I did some of the blackest rooms, toughest rooms in New York and New Jersey with some with some heavy hitters, Bill Bellamy and some other dudes, Teddy Carpenter. And it's like, yo, no, I wasn't getting passes. I earned my Well, and the- I didn't come out as a cutesy novelty. He'll look at a cute 16 year old. Yay. No, I came out with my on the table like I was Richard Pryor at 14. Well, I will say this. Even though I know I wasn't. When, you, uh, when you're a kid, I, and I'm, I'm saying this from people that I've seen from watching, and I've seen young comics, young comics come into a room to do a show. Yeah, you're cute. So some people are going to like you because you're cute, especially your family is going to come out and support shows. But I've seen cute kids that are cute coming out to do comedy, and there's people in there who spent money at a show. They're buying these two drinks that they didn't want to buy. They're sitting there, and then some kid comes out, and they're like, this month, now I'm going to have to listen to these chirpy little kid jokes. Right. And if you come with it and you t- you change them, that's one thing. Right. But not everybody wants to see a kid. I've seen people just be get up and go get drinks because they know they're going to be talking about something that's not right. relevant to them. Right. You, you know, we all, I, I guess my point is this, we all have our challenges. That feels like it's delivered. That feels to me, that can only be delivered a certain kind of way. With some, dude, psh, please. And he start piffed. Psh, dude, you... You kid, seventeen. You're you're a novelty. He wants credit though for what he does. He's a funny, Neri. Yes, he is. I've always said that. So, but this, this, the the thing with this is, and this is what people won't get. And I, a lot of comedians don't get this. And when you argue about something like this, I, I don't understand because it's not about funny. And we've talked about this. It's not about who's the funniest. This is why when I'm saying the gift that you give people that they take home, whatever it is. It's not about being funny. It's a, there's so many aspects to being a comedian that rises to a different level. There are, like, first of all, there are a lot of great basketball players, and I've used this analogy before, that are never going to get on the NBA court. And they may be better than some of the people you've seen on an NBA court, but they're never going to get there because All and one just ended the chat. <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of parts that go with being an NBA player. And then on a level of a star, there's more parts that go with it. And it's not just about skill. If it was just about skills, uh, maybe we'd have a different kind of argument or conversation. But it's not. There's more that goes along to this. And that's why when all these people come out, and, and I'm sorry, now I'm going to take it a little bit to sports because it just makes me mad. And they don't, they can't do these these things that are afterwards. Like uh, they're, they're, you know, they're emotional, and so they can't come out and talk to the press afterwards. They can't. That's part of being a professional athlete that gets paid millions of dollars, uh, or or gets paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. It, to grow your sport, they need you to do that. And if you can't do that, you're not going to go onto those next levels. That's just the way it is. Same thing with comedy. You got to be able to do certain things. It's not about just being funny. It takes a lot of work, and it's not just funny work. Otherwise, it's just if it's just about the jokes. 
Well, there's a lot of people who don't put a lot of effort in that part either, but <laughs> whatever. So yeah, uh, that that was my experience uh, with two bulls. Uh, let me move on. That, that would be a good name for the podcast, though. Two bulls. Two bulls. Yeah, it's never gonna happen. And just fight. Just <laughs> fight, argue. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that can't sustain itself. I don't think. I don't know. Um, should is it okay or not okay to mourn O.J. Simpson? I don't. What are you? What are you mourning? No, no, and I know no, no, no. But I mean that. What are you mourning? Was he? Was he? Did you connect to him when he was a player uh, in Buffalo? Did you? Was he your favorite athlete? Was he? You know, if you're mourning him for what, how he affected your life, well, yeah, why shouldn't you be able to mourn someone that, that passed? Man, some every every horrible person has people that that still love, love them, them yeah. and and have and are going to mourn for him. But uh, yeah, why not? Uh, Caitlyn Jenner sent out a tweet uh, that I saw on the internet. Most people, I'm sure, saw on the internet where she just said, "Good riddance." Uh, and I, and I wish I could remember the guy's rebuttal because it was pretty smart and clever. But I, I don't even think my rebuttal would have been as smart or clever. I just thought it would have been scathing and necessary. I was like, yeah, the good riddance, this is coming from the same person who probably said that once they lost it. You know what I mean? <laughs> out of here. Um, Lift up the sheets. Good riddance. Good riddance, yeah. Uh, but on, on, as we were catching our flight to Calgary on the propeller plane, Andy, you came up with well, a it, great. Oh, I, like, thought it was I just thought it was too easy, though. But it's just. Look, I love how you give yourself credit and then take it away. But I, it's, it, to me, but you didn't say that at the time. I didn't. I, I I thought this was this would be the best way though for for OJ to have a funeral. And Hilarious. They get a white Bronco. Hilarious. They go down the 405 with just nothing but police follow him. Slow. Just, and his caskets in the white Bronco. Just going down the front. That's but hilarious. All the people come out just like they came out just when they were chasing oh. him. And they wave goodbye to OJ. And then they take him to probably the, the famous, what is it, White Lawn Cemetery or whatever. They, yeah. And, and, and they pull up and, and, and the Bronco opens up and then there comes the... That's brilliant. He, he, he go, it's full circle. Yeah, 100%. That is, that, I told you, that, that if that was a real stand-up joke, that's stealable. Yeah, but I, I, I think that someone has to have already said something. No, about that. stop. Give yourself credit. Somebody, somebody sent me an email when we read the emails that said exactly what I just said. They go, Yo, Andy, you are funny, but sometimes you downplay yourself and they can't stand it. Dude, <laughs> put your d*** on the table. I, I just think, you know, these are just thoughts that we I have know, as but comedians. don't give yourself credit and then go, well, it's easy, or somebody else thought of it. If somebody else thought of it, we would have heard it. Maybe. I, I, well, I just think, I don't know. I don't know. I'm always looking for the thing that no one else is going to think about. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should just, just worry about nah, what I want to say. That, shit, that was worthy of you getting on one knee <laughs> and me putting a James Brown cape on you and you popping out of it. Uh, that's like, and I'm giving myself credit. That's like I said, one, I think one of the best jokes I came up with uh, during somebody's passing is when I said, dude from Criss Cross died. I wonder if they're going to put him in the casket backwards. I think that's funny. As dude, that Bronco is hilarious. It was just, but visually, it's just the right way for him to go out. Right. Did I, you see what I sent you? Uh uh. You didn't get the clip? Oh, no, I got it right here. I'm going to play it. I'm gonna play okay. It. Did, did Jay Moore? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did get oh, it. Oh, dude, I got to play this. This is yeah, Jay I did, Moore. I did, I did get it. Doing. Norm McDonald talking about OJ. Norm McDonald, you know, I, uh, I heard the news that OJ Simpson died, but I don't, I don't, uh, well, I don't see him up here in heaven, you know? Maybe he went somewhere else. I don't know. Well, I, I got a joke for you. You know what? Uh, hey, what do you, what do you call a, a coffin with OJ Simpson in it? Well, that's a, uh, well, that's a, it's a juice box. <laughs> oh, he's got it. it's the uh, you see. Uh, uh, oh, he's got that. He's got that. Yeah, you know what? What's funny though is that, and I and I just think this is so funny. Even doing the impression of him, and his is a great impression. But Norm drags it out so much longer, and that was what was so funny. It, like as a comedian, you want to get to the funny part, right? 
It's almost like Norm avoided the funny part. Like he left, he kept pushing it right. out further and further. And that's the only thing that I, I know because when he goes, well, anyway, but Norm would, there's a no, there's never a, a no uh, anyway. It, yeah. it, it's never like we're going to go on and it'd be like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, all right. All right. Right. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, I don't know. It's just so, I miss it. It, it. Comedians that you don't realize how much you appreciate them until, you, as, as they pass and you are looking for their commentary and you, and it's not there, you know, like I, we've talked about Carlin and you know, like I, I said to him, I always felt it was kind of preachy and that's why I don't have him up there as high as like a, most comics have him. but you meant dude, I, it's, it's someone I miss right now. Like I would love to have Carlin's commentary. Could, could you imagine Carlin during the time of Trump and, and everything that's going on right now would be unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I would love to have Norm in that same way of commenting on today. So it, these people, we don't appreciate them enough with their, as they're doing it. Uh, we don't appreciate it. Mm. You know, uh, something that I, I, I've been working on, and I, at the same way I looked at my man, I forget his name, on um, oh God, America's Got Talent. Uh and it clicked for me. I went, that's how you do Tony Soprano. My Trump is, I'm about to, yo, my Trump, I'm, I'm, I was on Instagram and I saw a dude and I went, ah, there's the note. Governor Jean Josh. Uh, that's the note. Now I got to fine tune some things. But before when I was doing it, I would bleed into Stewie. Well, you know, but, Governor Shanto, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, that's right there. So I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm here, I'm hearing the note. So I just gotta start watching some Trump and pick up little subtle. Excuse me, the American people. I, I, I get something. I'm in the neighborhood. I'm in the neighborhood. I, I'm knocking on doors. I'm gonna get the right one though. So I'm kind of proud of myself with that. It, it, you you uh, your joke has been hidden. It, it hit in Canada too. Yeah, it, that part where where, where I do the uh, Mr. President, how's it? I totally annihilated it. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm speaking. It was the best thing she ever had. So and it, it got a big rah. So that lets me know I'm on to something. Um, okay, uh, let's dive into the meat and potatoes. Uh, Hollywood homicide. Before I ask you any questions. Hollywood homicide. Oh my God. No, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> New Homicide, New York. I was like, I, I, I think I watched the wrong thing, Aries. We're going to have to redo this. Holy shit. Is it Homicide, New York? It's, it's uh, Homicide, New York. Let me put that uh, the creator. Uh, homicide, New York. Wolf, yeah. of course, SUV, Law and Order. And it's had that feel to it, which I think part, part, part is, is part of what made it good. Um, so. Before I ask you any, well, here's my first question. Uh, overall, what did you think? Was it riveting? No, it's not riveting. I don't think it's riveting. Really? Yeah. You didn't enjoy it? I I I, I enjoyed it, but riveting is a word like I'm, it's suspenseful, and I'm, I mean, I it was riveting like a podcast is riveting in in uh, in in, uh, in these uh, s- Death kind of podcast, uh, this crime, this that crime genre. Right. I, I'm not. I, I was. I really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. And I love. Was it worth the watch? Oh yeah. Okay. Because what I like, what, what, where I feel like, Wolf's fingerprint. I might be wrong, but I think it Wolf is, Dick. Wolf Dick is him. Uh, uh, getting the right, chem, the right people to put the the right cops to make this work. Well, it wasn't like it was a, a fictional cast. It no, was real. no, but you had to find, you know, there's a lot of stories out there. There's a lot of death. Okay, I see what you're saying. But you had to have, you also had to have people that were, uh, that had some kind of reason to listen to them. And I, I even called you and I said, hey, did you like the one? Detective Mooney. Yeah. And I said, and then I go, yeah, he's the Nick Nolte of this thing. Yeah. And, you know, there's that gruff sound, that who he was, right. his character, you know, the, and they bring that to life in this. And that's what, when you say, is it riveting? Well, I, I was very entertaining, but it, like, I wasn't like on my edge of my seat going, oh my God, this happened. Right. There's some moments, though, that you want to like go slap some people, <laughs> bunch some people up the <laughs> head. But, uh, I know uh, exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, but these, uh, but but they, I think they had the right group of officers, uh, law enforcement that, that they tell the story well. 
and right. that their their presence in it, I think, is is, is important to carry this the story. So I thought that was a good job, not just like another crime podcast, but this is very close to that. <clears throat> and 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 I, I wrote the descriptions of each episode because I because when I rewatched it, I'm just writing my notes, but I'm going, dude, if you don't contextually at least let the people know for those who haven't seen it that you want that that you want them that, that you want to see it. Uh, God damn, you got to make them not feel like it's all over the place. So episode one, a shooting that left three dead and two injured in an apartment above the iconic Carnegie Deli sends detectives on a relentless hut for the killers. Um, And I know you always mention cats. Yeah. I didn't even know Carnegie Deli was that popular. Oh, yeah. Carnegie Deli Deli was a big deal. Really? Yeah. You've been to it? Yeah. Cats or Carnegie? Oh, cats. Why? I just like how they do it, how they slice it up in front of you, how they... It's it's different. It, Carnegie was a big sandwich. Right, we supposed to be talking about murder, now we're talking about yeah. meat. Yeah. <laughs> Sandwiches. Yeah, no, and it was and it, it was good. It was fr- Everything right. was good. But the way they cut it up for you in front of you and drop it on that, and it's it's fresh, the, the cats has always been my, mm. my my favorite. There's some other delis, though, in New York that are worthwhile. Right. But, um, I just want to say this though, as we before we go, this one of the things that I asked you when we you told me we we're going to talk about this, and I love this. Uh, each episode is its own episode. Though. Yeah, so you don't have to watch it in order. Yeah, you can watch it out of order, but uh, if you watch, if you start off at the first one, you get introduced to most of the detectives. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. That was yeah. the word I was looking for. Not cops, not officers, detectives. detectives that's right. the word I was looking for. Okay. <clears throat> um, so in this particular episode, yeah, there's, there's a young lady and she's in her apartment with five friends. And she sells, and a dude that she normally sells to decides he's going to rob her for the in the cash. Uh, he only ends up getting twenty eight hundred dollars. How do you know it's a black crime? Because only rob and do life sentences for fifteen dollars and a hairbrush and a pack of cigarettes. Uh, so the guy goes into the house. One of them is under the assumption that they're just going to rob. That's it. He even tells one woman. Uh, she goes, please don't hurt me. He said, miss, I'm not even here for that. So while he's duct taping uh, some of the victims, uh, the, the the guy that actually did all the shooting takes one of, the, one of the women into a room and he shoots her in the head. They end up shooting all five people. Three died, two survived. Um, and my question as I'm watching this, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm going, if it's five people versus two, even though two have guns and the five don't, knowing there's a strong chance that once you're tied up and you're defenseless and you could be killed, wouldn't it be best to say it and just try and fight your way out of it, even if it means getting shot? In other words, wouldn't it be best to give yourself a chance to live than surrender helplessly? Everybody feels like they're going to that people don't want to kill and that they'll come to their senses and this will end in a good way. Man. That's no, no, no. I'm, I'm being honest. The the, uh, the World Trade Center attack, that there was enough people on the plane that they could have overpowered them. People would have got cut up, and some people might have died before, but not the whole plane went down. But they never thought that they were going to take the whole plane down. They always think that if you sit there and you do what people say, right. there's a better chance the outcome will be better. And that's what, that's what they thought. To me, the chance, if we're going to play the chance game, if you're saying to me, I'm, I could either play along and there's a chance they won't or I could play along and there's a chance they will that to me is not a decision that fight for your goddamn life because if you don't fight and they kill you once you're t- especially when you're helpless and tied up and bound where you can't do anything and you flat on your stomach face down well then you're but if you're not tied up and you rush them or a tussle ensues you still might get shot but you might wrestle the gun away you well, might do something. But you also have to remember there's five of them, right? How many were women? Weren't three of them women? Yeah. Okay, so the two guys. Uh, One, two. No, two women, three men. Okay. So, but a gun. A, a gun is like 10 guys. Dude, I, I, I'm i going to tell you this. If I, all five people rush two people with a gun, no? A chance? I, I think you, I'll just tell you from this this perspective. Uh, I don't know if I told if I ever talked about this on here. I might have. I got robbed at gunpoint. Yeah, you mentioned it. Two guns. 
But by, by, by two different guys at the same time, right? Yeah. But that's two on one with two guns. But I'm still in the same situation where I got to hope that these guys just want my money and I'm going to get out of this alive. Because if, 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 what if I was standing there and it was me and, two, me and another guy? We're going to take on the two guns? There's a pretty good chance that we're, even if we serve, there's a good chance that they're going to take the money and leave. There's a better, I don't know what the odds are that you're going to get shot. But I know if you get into a fight, there's a pretty good chance some bullets are going to be shot and someone's going to get hit. I, I, I really thought about it because when the first gun hit me, I was like, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to turn around real quick? Do you, I even thought about passing out. Honestly, I just thought about <laughs> acting like I just had like I just had a heart attack, like oh, and just falling over and what the, what they would do. I mean, all those things go through. How your about mind running? Quick. You didn't just think take off? Oh, dude, they got me in a good place. I was right at my. I was I was in my car. I was I was putting something in the glove. I was on the driver's passenger side, the glove compartment. And when they came up, they came up, and I was wedged in my car, like I, I was in the door area. You know, the door is open, so I can't go anywhere. There's nowhere to go. So I'm stuck there. Now, I could have jumped in my car, but now I'm because now they can just shoot me in my car. And, and the thing is, when people have guns on you, you have to decide also, are they, are they ready to shoot? These guns were ready to go. Uh, and when you feel a barrel on you, it, it changes your thought process. Because there's, <clears throat> there's no, when the barrel's on you, there's no miss. It was literally on you? On me. One in my back, one in the back of my head. Oh, my God. So you, there's no miss. What if I, you know, and that's two guns, but you're, I know what you're saying here. Now, there's three guys, so one guy is going to be free, and there's, there's only two guns. But those first two guys are done. If, if they go to take those guns, if, if these guys are nervous, that's the other thing, too. One of the guys was nervous as f- and that's who you have to worry about. The one guy... Honestly, the one guy when he, I was robbed, I knew what he wanted. He wanted the money. He he was very it's funny to say professional, but he's professional about it. He he held his gun. He was fine. The other dude was shaking. Don't look at me. I'm scared. And that gun is just moving like this. And I'm like, you could take his gun, but there's a pretty good chance that he'd fire because even if he didn't want to fire, he'd fire because he's shaking. He's already nervous. That's the one that's going to kill you. The one who's scared. <clears throat> Uh, and then one of the survivors survived a, 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 a gunshot to the head. How do you survive a gunshot to the head? And, and the bullet went in his head and around, which is amazing. It goes in, it's around the brain. It just right. stayed, stayed up, on, uh, up to the bone of the head. Uh, man, because that's how the world works, man. And, you know, again, this is, uh, ah, there are two moments, one that I wrote down and one that I just thought of. This is why I struggle with the God thing. The one guy that survives goes, uh, the one who shot in the head, he goes, yeah, God must have been with me that night. He was with you, but not the others. Why? Why you and not the others? That makes God up. You spreading out protection selectively? God, the most powerful entity? That's why I'm going to it's crazy because that's our interpretation of it. How many times at the end of a football game? Well, you know, which I think is ridiculous. God, you know, God was on our side. To, God picked a team and they both prayed. God must not be a fan uh, 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 of, uh, of, uh, of Dallas. Well, I'll tell you who he is a fan of. <laughs> the greatest square jaw, Cliff Chen, Anglo-Saxon, purebred white man to ever live. Tom Brady and the Patriots kid. How many Super Bowls? So, you know, God is a Bostonian, and he loves the Brady kid. He's been with him the whole time. Jesus Christ! I don't mean it like that, but Jesus Christ! <laughs> All right, Bobby Patterson, by the way. Um, yeah, man. Um, and you know, I, I, this is something as I'm watching this, and they're, and these detectives are are doing their thing. I go, as we say, there's levels to this. Where do detectives learn the skills to be so good at what they do that separates a mediocre detective from a he or she, where he, from a he or she that is the MJ of detectives? Because while I'm sure there are things that are taught to them, I have to believe that there has to be a certain level of intuition, instinct, and intelligence that simply can't be taught. How do you learn that? Uh, there are classes, though, where you people give away tells and they, 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 they let you know that they're lying. Uh, but I think what you just said, intuition, you have to have it. But I think, I think these really good ones are there for the right reasons. 
I'm, what I mean, they want to better their community. They want to, right. you know, the, what is it, to protect and to serve? Mm-hmm. I, I think there are people that want to protect and serve, that want to have a good community, that feel like they're, that that's their calling. Right. We don't know what makes people want to be doctors and other people want to be, you know, bricklayers and other people want to be, you know, uh, welders. All these jobs are a calling and a skill set that you have to have some innate skill to. And I think these guys have it. And I think if they really are doing it for the right reasons, uh, it comes out this way because the guys that we have on here, and I really like that one detective, the the one you Mooney, see, dude. He, he 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 doesn't even look like he in those pictures where he's young. He doesn't even look like he looks like he's right. just somebody who's drinking at a bar. He looks like he looks like a, a dude from Boston. Yeah, okay, <laughs> right, right. And so uh, you know, but he he's definitely meant for what he does. And yeah. but uh, and I, I I know it's a five part series, so I'm not going to give away the last part. But you know, it, it takes a toll on these guys. Well, no, you don't. You don't have to give it away because I was actually going to say that. Like when you go, there's people that want to better their communities and do certain things. Every from several of these detectives to even the the. Uh, the district attorney, or is it the prosecutor? What was the guy with the glasses? That district attorney yeah, he's or prosecutor? The DA. The DA. He got so emotionally caught up that he had to get out of that and yeah. do something different. Well, they talked about it because they said he wasn't ready. He got into it and he didn't have the like, tough skin in a way. Yeah, because you have to have other crime scenes that you've been to and you've had to. He got like two rough ones right away. Right. And even some of the detectives got a little emotional yeah. with some of it. So, you know, it's, I'm sure there are guys that do this clearly to earn a paycheck. And then there are others that do it that earn the paycheck, but they genuinely give a shit. And and I and and you know, that's respectable. Yeah. Well, that and that's as we talk about and we talk about policing, and I've talked about policing on here. You have, uh, and, and we usually go back to the same thing. You know, why do we let though the 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 knock is the knock that we have isn't the policing; it's the knock that the, the, these good police let the other ones. Get, I won't say give them a pass, but don't turn them in, and that—that's right. the problem. Right. But these guys, this, these guys are exceptional detectives. They're not street cops; they're detectives. Uh, unbelievable, man, to put that kind of effort in. But I like when you say taking the toll. If you have to go see these scenes, and I, I and I and I kind of, you know, not the, the the street cop, the cop that's on the street. Mm-hmm. If you're those first on the scene guys, and you see this stuff. How how do you not get a little jaded towards humanity? How do right. you because you're looking at some of the most horrific stuff that you and, and episode two gets more horrific and I like how they start off this the first one is is horrible because it's horrible uh, she's she's an actress she was on she was in Dirty Dancing the yeah. show so she 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 had skills she was a talented person but right. she was also uh, had some good. And she had a very small community, and it helped finance, I guess, finance her her music career is what she right. was doing. And uh, to have that, you know, and she, they said it was a tight group, and they didn't let just anyone in. And so one of the people that were in the group or the people who went the wrong way on her looked at it an opportunity to get some money out of it, and that's where it all goes wrong. So uh, that's the first one. Well, this is my last note on this first one is this. <clears throat> the one of the detectives, I even think it was, uh, was it Detective? No, it wasn't Detective Mooney, but it was a, the big bald guy. But he goes, you know, there's levels of denial. These guys go from, I don't know what you're talking about, I wasn't there, to I was there, but I don't know what you're talking about, to I was there, but I didn't do it, to I was there, and I did it. Uh, and I'm going between that and the fingerprints. Like like they said, we lifted your fingerprints off the banister. What the f- is wrong with with these criminals? Like... Like, who the f*** doesn't know that if you're going to commit a crime, you wear f***ing gloves? I would think that's in the basic, I'm going to commit a crime for dummies 101. Um, and how do you not allow yourself to get, how do you uh, allow yourself to get interviewed to the point of basically telling on yourself, no lawyers, no gloves? Again, there's levels to this shit. And I go, some idiots absolutely deserve to be caught. Well, but here, here's the thing with that one guy. And I, and I could be completely wrong because I don't know, you know, that, that that's up for debate in this in this episode though too the one guy right. there, there's the there's the two the shooter and then the other guy who said that he was just going there for the money if you're going there for the money and you're robbing especially at this time this is when uh was illegal right and it's not a huge amount of money right you're going to go in there you're going to it's someone you know you already have they know who you are because she knew who he was so she's going to know who she is he is so you're going to go rob her. You're not going to be friends with this person anymore. You're probably not going to stay in that same city anymore. You're probably willing to leave. Uh, or you just don't give a f- 
But he's going in there to rob and take, uh, not to kill anybody, because if you're at that time, if you're selling and you get robbed, what are you going to do? You're not going to go to the police. You can't go to the police and go, hey, someone broke in and held us, held us at gunpoint and took my weed and then left. Right. What are they going <clears> to <throat> They're going to arrest you for selling so you can't. So that if you're that one guy and you go, hey, it's going to be easy. It's just this girl. I know she's, she has this good weed. She's probably going to have a few thousand dollars. Let's go in there. Let's hold her up. Let's take the, the weed. And the guy was like, I don't know her. And I'll just go in there with him. I'll get my money. And I'll leave because there's nothing that anybody can do about it, really. Right. But instead of that happening, someone gets nervous. And I don't know if he was nervous or if he was angry or what. You know, who knows what was said in that room because they knew each other. That's the other part right, of this. Right, right. So you think he... Killed her because he had to. Well, or because, yeah, she said something that he went, he either got nervous because obviously she knows him, or she he knew that she, or knew someone that knows him that it was going to ruin his life or whatever. And, you know, most people at that time would go, I'm out of here, and just walk out the door. If they, but he had it in it to kill her. Okay, well, then if that's the case, why not wear a f-ing mask? Yeah, I don't know. What and, and, if, and if you're worried about her recognizing your voice, do a silly voice. Be, be, be Mickey Mouse. Oh, give me the money. Who knows why this happened the way they did? It wasn't obviously thought out very well by this by the guy who did the killing. The guy, a lot of guys aren't thinking, but you know, a lot of guys aren't thinking that this is going to go this far. But if you have a gun on you and you're going into a crime, you better be prepared to use the gun. That's why you brought it. And if you don't use the gun and you get caught anyway and you had the weapon, now you have this is a different kind of uh, a crime. Um criminals don't think about this stuff. Good criminals don't think about it. We'll, we'll have covered everything and they don't go and rob people for $2,800 with, with a gun to go get some. I love when Steve Harvey said, you know, if you ain't good at crime, don't commit crime. Do what you're good at. Yeah. There's some people that are great at criminal crimes. Uh, episode two, uh, after an excavated body is found in Central Park Lake, a pair of unlikely suspects are implicated in the killing as shocking revelations surface. Um, so, uh, yeah. And they talk about Central Park, and, and like Central Park is such a major piece to the New York landscape, but yet in the 70s and 80s was described as dangerous, especially at night. Times Square, I understood, but Central Park, a park? Uh, and I thought to myself, New York's transformation from seedy and dangerous to warm, fuzzy, and family-friendly is amazing. Basically, New York was Mike Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good description. Because, yeah. um, again, as a kid growing up in the 80s, I heard about the Central Park Five and, you know, a couple, you know, uh, people getting assaulted. Uh, but most of my time as a kid during the, was spent in Central Park during the day. Yeah. Uh, but I just would go, it's a park. But even at your time as a kid, because you're older, yeah. when I was growing up, I'm 10 years older than you, Central Park, you didn't go in there at night. You knew there was problems. There were people that, there was a lot of problems in New York at that time. And, you know, that you go hide out in the park. Right. It was an easy place to go. Right. You can't, you commit a crime in a park, yeah, a park now, you know, you go, there's actually signs in the park that said, don't do this. And if you do that, People are going to call someone on you, and you're going to get kicked out of the park or arrested. Right. So it, it's different now. And just so you guys know, <clears throat> this guy uh, was like 50 times. All done by two 15-year-olds. Yeah, and when uh, when they told me, I didn't even care about the 15-year-old part. I just thought, I just thought Aries just listened to that, and he's... He, oh, trust me, my head was <laughs> doing the Stevie Wonder nigga. Like, <laughs> I was looking away from the screen. Can you really love me? I was, oh. Just something about Bones and you. I just knew that that was going to be a problem. Uh, yeah. And in the way that they actually get caught, they, they didn't have to get caught. Like, I don't understand yeah, how they got caught. You know what is, what is, a, what is a through line? through all of these, and, and it made me ask the question, these people tell on themselves, and I'm going, nah, I just credited these detectives for being these intelligent sleuths, but I'm also going, is it really that they're great or that the criminals are just that stupid? I think it's a, it's a combination because, first of all, the girl, the girl who's living at the Majestic, which is supposed to be this, I, I don't know the Majestic. This adopted girl. Yeah, it's supposed to be this very, uh, very high-end uh, living environment. Her dad's got tons of money. 
So uh, I guess she isn't there, and he calls the police, and they come over, and then they find her and the boyfriend taking a bath. Cleaning blood off each other. But they didn't know that he... But the detective only saw a drop of blood, and he said, oh, he cut his head, he fell. And so it was, it was noted, but it wasn't a big deal. And then he leaves, and then they must have talked, and they must have overthought it. And they called the police, and she said, there's a body in New York. And then, yeah, she told the cops. If she doesn't call the cops... That guy probably, there's a very slim chance that he puts the Majestic Hotel, right. an affluent teenager, and her boyfriend at that crime scene in the park. Right. Uh, it probably isn't going to happen. And, and this girl's background was she was no saint. She was problematic. She was, a, she was you know, she, people didn't like her because she was just a, 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 a kind of a child. She has some control issues. Control she, issues. Um so between the murder and her behavior problems, I they, they was adopted. You see, the parents didn't want nothing to do with her. You know, I, you know this this I, I have a friend. Uh, well, not really so much as someone that I went to school with a long time ago. I don't really keep up with him, but he was a really nice guy. Was adopted by uh, a family that had good, you know, well, we're, we're, did well, and uh, normal person, good guy, right. Seems like a fair trade. Like, I needed a kid. You were available. I'm going to get you a good life. We're going to, everything's going to be fine. And the first thing I thought of is like, how are you this parent that you want to give a good life to someone? Um, and and I'm, I'm using good life in a financial way because I don't know what the home life was, but I'm assuming that it, I, it didn't, no, no questions were brought up about the parents. But you, you get a kid, and then you get the kid that is going to be the problem, that's going to, you know, make your life miserable? I mean, do you think you want to return the kid at that point? I was going to ask you. Now, as, as, a, as, a, as a parent of a biological child, you're the biological ch- parent. If your kid f***ed up and f***ed up and just continues to f*** up, it's in the rule book. You don't ever abandon your kid. But if you're adopted, <laughs> what's the limit? Before you go, I got to return this back to the pet shop. I don't know. And, you know, I would think, though, that you fall in love with the kid. You, the connection, from what I understand, is supposed to be the same. You, you raise the kid. And then they said she, when she first went to school, she did well. They, she got along with everybody. Something happened. Something happened. Maybe not. Maybe I, uh, maybe it is the home life. Maybe it is. And we just didn't know about it. Maybe. But it, there, was, there was something that went wrong because she turned into a, a straight-up killer. And, and her boyfriend, he was described as an extrovert. Yeah, he's in a different situation. He's living in Spanish Harlem. Spanish Harlem doesn't have come from money. But a good life, but a, but a, a nice life. I mean, right. you know, it, it's not a financially uh, successful life, but it's it's a, li- it's a good home life. He's so, constantly being picked on at school, doesn't have friends. Because he's quiet. He's yeah. kind of, what did they call him? What did they say? There, there was a word that they used. Uh, oh, it was smo- it, Herb. A herb, yeah, he was a herb. That's what I called him and him. Yeah, a herb. Yeah, that was an East Coast thing. Yeah, uh, he was a herb. Yeah. So, um yeah, and so he was getting picked, and they 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 formed a bond, and then right. I guess, and they don't ever really say that they were dating, uh, even though they were taking a bath, but then they were also breaking up with each other, and so it was kind of an interesting combination. But these two, so let's fast for, flash forward to the to the to the night of the crime. So this guy, uh, the the victim's name was Mike McCarroll, Michael McCarroll, and he would hang out in the park with buddies of his, and they would get sauced up, uh, and on this particular evening. Uh, the teenage girl and her boyfriend, Chris, uh, decide to go rollerblading. And they meet up with Mike, who's now by himself. He's had a few beers. Um, And she decides, her and her boyfriend, to go skinny dipping in the lake. And when, oh, and prior to this moment, they said that she said to her boyfriend, I'm going to kill somebody tonight. So they definitely had problems. So she gets out of the lake, she's butt naked, and she looked chilly. So the cops said that based on what was told to them uh, by her, uh, Mike puts his arm around her to kind of warm her up. This sends her boyfriend into a rage. He pulls out the knife and then does what he does. And I just went to myself, um, I have a hard time believing that a man standing at over six feet and weighing 200 pounds plus pounds can't fight off two 15-year-olds. He was drunk. They said he was a three-point something, like three times over the legal limit. 
he's drunk. And if they get if he gets one good slash in there, you're kind of a little incapacitated. Mm. But I also like that when they said when, when the cops said when they when they are going through it and they're saying, but now it's looking really sketchy for him, the Mike guy, because why is he drinking? Why is he giving drinks to these right. young kids? And then you find out that the young kids had the beer and that what they lured him away. Right. So right. Uh, well, they lured him away, but it wasn't easy because he likes to drink. He likes to drink, but they right. but because he had beers and they were going go right. to go. So, so the reason I don't believe this, uh, her story about him slashing, is because they had beers. Mm-hmm. They knew that they were luring him away. She had had a story about getting in the water. I could see her going, "He's, co- I'm cold," and then her saying, "He's touching me." You know, d- right? I, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not. I shouldn't be blaming her, but they, the the way that they portrayed her, uh, in the criminal court case, yeah, she's she's the one that has these this agenda and these things to accomplish. But also, she she kind of was halfway throwing Chris under the bus at the beginning. In the beginning, because and this is where again, this is where the detective skills come in. They noticed part of the bruises on his body was rollerblades. So at one point, while Chris is stabbing him, she was kicking him. Um, so it was like. No, you, at first you you were trying to put uh, 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 pawn yourself off as a witness, but now that we know you kicked him, you're an assailant. But if she was skinny dipping and he started slashing him, how does she have her rollerblades on? So he's he, she's hitting him with the rollerblades. I guess. See this this whole the rollerblade marks were on his legs. Yeah. So I, I I think this is a different story. I don't think the whole. But you don't buy her being completely innocent. No, no, I don't buy her being innocent at all. I think it was all manipulated by her. Uh, I, I think that, I, 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 yeah, because we're talking about someone that they're talking about. He never, he never turns on her. He never says anything about her the whole time. Right. Um, and then she also ends up getting going to, going to jail. What was what was her sentence? She got out early. Yeah, she. They both. Well, he they, well, because they were minors. Yeah, they both ended up. Uh, not serving only three years, I guess each. Yeah, and then uh, she ends up having to go do her full time afterwards because she had she still had problems. She she she's a problem. Yes, um, and to hear the main prosecutor, and you know they 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 interview Mike McCarroll's brother, who was of course pissed off because he felt like how is this justice, and to hear the main prosecutor in this say how difficult he used the word difficult, how difficult this case was going to be. Is so disheartening in the name of justice. So you can have an actual body that's been dismembered a gazillion times, cut open, and have their intestines poured out, and this is difficult to prosecute? Well, you have, like he said, you have to, can't just prove that they, she had, they had to prove that she was there, that she was a participant, not just there. Right. Because otherwise he went crazy and there was never an intent for anybody to be harmed and then she was just an innocent bystander in this. Right. But that's why I'm saying this, it was so, man, it, he was manipulated to go to where they killed him with the beer, come and have beers with us over here, took him away from anybody else that was there, had them away. That wasn't done by him. That was done by her. Yeah. She's the one who manipulates things. He doesn't. He isn't that. They never said that he was like the smart guy, the mastermind guy, the guy. That this is this is her right. mo. Is is pushing people's buttons, moving them around. Right. So yeah, she was definitely. It seems from the story, the way that it's told, she was there. The way that it went in court, she was there. She she was a participant. She was beating him uh, at the same time they're slashing him. When she says and she admits to saying, "I told him to cut the stomach open so that we could drown him." so that they wouldn't find the body. And she said it in a way that she was saying she was trying to protect him to get rid of the body so that he wouldn't be caught. So had she not called the police and made the call, they'd have got away with this. I think so. Wow. Because the blood evidence is going to be washed away, unless there's some of his blood that they've... Right. But, but he doesn't. he's not in the system, so they're not going to catch him from his blood. Right. He's a 15-year-old kid. And these... This, He's a six, what would they say, six something, six foot. Mike big, McCarroll. Yeah, yeah big, big six, guy. Yeah. They're not going to think two 15 year old kids. Right. So I think they would have got away with it. I think that they, she, this is part of the manipulation though. She's overthinking it. Now she's thinking, well, they came, they saw the house, they saw the blood, they asked us about this. We have to come up with it and I'm going to get caught. So I'm going to turn him in and I'm going to say it was be self, that he did it because he was trying to protect me. Okay, there we go. There's my story. And she was trying to get ahead of the story. 
And she didn't care really about Again, it. Again, the moral of the story. Shut the f*** up. <laughs> uh, episode uh, three. Uh, an office building in the financial district becomes a 26th floor crime scene when a beloved mother and janitor mysteriously vanished without a trace. The woman's name was Eridiana Rodriguez. Um, they brought in the one detective in, in, in this building. They say there's, I forget however many cameras, but they brought in this one detective whose sole job it was to just look at eight hours of nonstop security camera footage um, that's what he does. This that's is what, he, what does. he does. And it ain't just one camera of eight hour footage. It's several. And I'm just going, and the dude even said, I have a passion for this. I just put on my heavy metal Steve music and just look at a blank screen for eight hours until I see something that stands out. How do you, what, 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 where do you develop this passion? And that's a skill set, man. Yeah. Yeah. There's some quirky out here, man. Yeah. Thank God for him. But, it, and that's, that is, this one was like a David Blaine, uh, the magician yeah. kind of thing. Because this woman goes missing. Uh, she never left the building. There's no footage of her ever leaving the building. And this woman goes missing for almost 48 hours, I think. Yeah, over 48 hours. Over 48 hours. They can't find her. They can't find her. And they search the building, send it dogs, and sniffing shit and all of that. Um, and here's again where I go, this, it's part smart detective shit that I go, how did he notice this? But then it's also me going, the guy's a dumb criminal. Uh, the fact that the detective, and, and, and just so you guys know, uh, what was the guy's name? Jason... Uh, this is the big cop. No, this, this is this is no the Joseph Pabone, the guy that kills oh, yeah, the lady. Okay. Um, she's complaining to her brother, who also works in this building. She does jan she's a janitor during a night shift when there's really nobody in the building, but maybe her and some the security guard in the lobby, and maybe one other person. Uh, she was complaining to her family that this guy is stalking her. Is this the one who killed? Yes. I, I didn't think he was the one who killed her. I thought they interviewed him and they, they gave him a no, pass. No, no, no. He was the one who did it. I thought, I don't think that they're the same people. No, they are. Okay. They are. Then, this, I missed, this, yeah. then I missed it. That might have been when you dozed off a little Could bit. Could have been. Um, she's complaining, yeah, this dude is stalking me, blah, blah, blah. She's scared. And her brother was like, I'm going to get you a new job. And her brother had interacted with this dude several times. So there's one point where the guy that watches the security footage notices this guy. So they bring him in for questioning, and the detective goes, uh, he noticed he was wearing a long sleeve shirt in July. Um, he goes, dude, it's July. He goes, trust me, I'm a cop. I got to wear a suit jacket, long shirt, and a tie. But if it, if it was up to me, I'd show up in a T-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. But I'm noticing this dude in the middle of July has on a long sleeve shirt. So he asks the guy, can you take off your shirt? The guy willingly does. That's when he sees scratches on his arm. Then he goes, hey, you mind if we get some DNA off you? The guy goes, yes. So between, first of all, I'm going, what made the detective make him take his shirt off? Because he noticed July and yeah. I wouldn't have thought to do that. Yeah, but I love the other part about this. When he gets, his excuse is that he helped somebody unload um, some, 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 uh, some metal like, stuff from his. Yes. Uh, from his. But union wise, He's not allowed to do that. And so he, but I love the detective goes, well, aren't you in union area? And so you know, the, and, and union guys, if they have a job, they can't do the other job. Right. You have to stick to exactly what your job right. is. So once he said that to him, he had him as right. far as that goes. Um, so my thing is, okay, again, the, 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 the instinct of the detective to pick up on the shirt thing. Then he sees scratches, which, of course, insinuates a struggle. This woman fought for her life. Why would you volunteer to take your shirt off? Knowing you got scratches, which is why you put the shirt on. Then why would you volunteer to give DNA? Again, you're telling on yourself. Yeah, but I think that if you don't take it off, then you look, you look 
there's something they're okay. Gonna, they're going to try to figure out. Okay, but don't they have to then get a warrant to make you do it? And in that time, you can leave. I don't know how you cover up scratches. Maybe get a good makeup artist. I don't know what, but you give your chance a chance for an out. Well, you're looking at it from you're, you're looking at it as, from a smart person's point of view. Well, if you're smart, you wouldn't have been in that situation in the first well, place. Well, that no. If you're sane, <laughs> okay. If you're sane, you wouldn't. Okay, so yeah. Um, but I still don't think he was the one that was. No, he hurt. was. No, because you know why? Because the DNA came back as a match. And then you must have really fell asleep. No, on no, this no, episode. no. Because this, the reason they gave it that they think that this guy did this is that he would. He, they caught him on the security camera going across to the little to the the bodega kind of store where there was alcohol. Yeah, and they think that they he caught her drinking. No, she caught him drinking. Right, he, right. he thinks she caught, caught him, him drinking. drinking, and that's why he did it to her. That was the to hide the body and to get well to kill her. They didn't want him to turn her in. He didn't want to lose his job. He didn't want to get in trouble. Right. And he ended up killing her because he didn't try to kill her. He tried to. At first, they think that she died in the vent. Okay, because so he didn't try to kill her. Well, so he, he duct taped her. He hog tied her. He put her in the air conditioned vent, thinking that at some point she would do what? Find I think a way out. Thought, I thought. I think that he thought that he would come back. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking. I think that he 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 reacted. He did what he did. He put her in there, and he thought he was going to come back without the police all over there. Take her out, and she ain't gonna say nothing. Yeah, because if you do it, I'll kill you for real this next time. I think that that, that I think that's the mentality that he. Well, had. then he's a bigger idiot than uh, we know he is. I, I just think that that there. Why would you put her in there alive, in hopes that she dies and they can't then find her? Then you might as well kill her. He did, but he didn't kill her. He didn't knock. She was. They said she asphyxiated inside there. I don't think he puts her in there with duct tape, no chance to breathe, hog tied, and that physical condition w- with the intent of her living. And he had, and they said he had a history of domestic abuse. A domestic abuse. This was his first kill. Yeah, no, the, the, no, no. Um, and the detective goes, once they searched the building for the umpteenth time, they finally went into this one room and they said, it smelled like death. He goes, it, it was the smell of death. Yeah, they were eventually going to smell this. Right, but at first they didn't smell it because they said something about how the air would rise. Yeah. So it, they, it, it, it was it was mist. Um, and I'm going, damn, dude, I, I, I've often heard in movies how horrific death smells like. I wonder what that smells like. You never smelled anything dead? No. Before? Really? No. Dead? Yeah. Like what? A piece of meat. Like someone left some uh, 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 raw meat out and it, and it spoiled. You never. Where am it? I at? Was somebody left raw meat out? Well, other than my house, if I leave raw meat out. I had a roommate that went to go uh, throw some meat away that they said that they didn't use it before the expiration date, and then mm-hmm. they put it in the sink underneath in the trash, and then didn't take the trash out, and then you know it. You don't take the trash but out; I, so it fills I'm, up. I'm quite sure a decaying body smells ten times worse. I'm than sure raw it does, meat. but just a little raw meat smells heinous as can mm. be. Uh, my last note on this, uh, they said, and this is where I'm going back to my guy, Joe King. They said when she was found hogtied and bound in the air conditioning vent, the crucifix that she wore around her neck was shoved into her mouth. Uh, and I'm going, so wait a minute. She wore a crucifix. She wore Jesus around her neck. So what she believed in didn't protect her. It was shoved in her mouth. She was a believer of faith, and that was her ending. So, Joe King, if you're listening, I'm asking you, why is that? Because she chose Satan. This is the un- this is why I'm going. This is unexplainable. It doesn't make sense. And if you can maintain your faith through all of that, well, then you're a better person than me. Well, because I'm just going. You got Christ around your neck. It's shoved in your mouth. And no, what the, the powers that be don't protect you. I'm going to tell you exactly what he's going to tell you, because she got to die with Jesus. Oh, she he was the Satan that took her out. Jesus doesn't say that he's going to uh, uh, allow you to live past Satan. He's going to be there for you to keep your spirit together when keep Satan, your spirit. So as she's hogtied in an yep, air conditioning vent, yep. which I could believe is so painful physically because of the contortion of your body and, gonna, and you can't breathe, you find peace in what? In Jesus, knowing that you're going to get to go see Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, that's what he's going to tell you. Do you agree with that? I don't know what I agree with. I'm going to be honest, I don't. 
Uh, well, and I and I can say that the Jesus thing is probably off the table for me, right? You know, as a Jew. Oh, here's the episode that I can't wait to discuss. This is where Andy's passion lied. Uh, episode four: the shooting death of a successful entrepreneur remains unsolved for decades until a tenacious assistant DA and a driven detective reexamine the case. The husband's name is Howard Pilmer, and the wife's name was Roz Pilmer. Long story short, uh, he also was uh, a, a, a gazillion times. Um, and the killer was his wife and her brother. Um, and I love how we, Andy and I were in the airport, I think, in Minneapolis. And I said, yo, what'd you think about that one? <laughs> it's like I couldn't even get the words out. You went, dad. I was just as mad, dude. I was so mad because, you know what? I'm going to tell you really why I was really mad when I think about it. As we go through the story, this is his girlfriend from high school that he marries. Right. You know, it, it ruins love for me, man. You, you, these two innocent kids get together and they're going to, and okay, so what? She fucks someone else. She sucks. I'm not saying her. I'm just saying in life. She fucks someone else, sucks someone else's. You get a divorce and you move on. And your life is hor- life's horrible for a while, but you get to you, you you reestablish and you come back. Nah, this isn't even that story. Right. This is this is <laughs> like like I I, saw, I met you. We're young. I, I fell in love. You're you're everything, and then me and my brother are gonna f- kill you. That to me is I don't know what what it was in right. me, but it just it it, it, it gutturally it just I, it's it made me so angry. Well, let me jump ahead to, and not saying that this is a reason to kill, because of course there is no reason to kill unless somebody's trying to kill you. But my question is, did she do it more so for the custody of their kid, which she said uh, was a big deal to her, that if they got divorced, um, one of them was going to get custody, and her, and what was, 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 what was really cool and heartbreaking is the dynamic between her husband, his father, and his son, the three of them were like a unit. You know, the the, the father loved his son the in, the way a father yeah. could yeah. love a son with all his passion and shit. and he loved his grandson who was a kid at the time. So, my question again becomes: Did she do this for the custody of the kid, or was it more about the apartment in New York, the ski home in the mountains, the, all the businesses, and the insurance money? Money and control. It's it's also the control. I, I don't think she ever. For the what I felt um, from a little bit of the story is that she didn't ever feel like she had control. It was all you know. It was his business. He they they he started this. The father. It was the father's business before, and he added to the business. And she was just the wife. And I think that she worked and she wanted to. I, I think that she felt smaller in this and I think the control and if you're going to get divorced and he's going to have all this money and he you you worked with him you did however you supported him and now he's going to go out and I'm going to go away and he's going to have all the money to get my my kid and he's going to have everything and I have nothing I think that I think that's that's the thought process you know sometimes and there are women who just want to be the wife and the more I older I get, the less I care about control. I just want to be the husband, Oprah. <laughs> you know? Is Barbara Walters still alive? I don't know. I think she is. I'll be the husband of Barbara Wawa. Yeah. Mm. What about Whoopi? Whoopi too. Yeah, okay. All my standards are going are leaving. <laughs> All my standards are <laughs> a quitting nigga. Um, and I go, dude, you, you you have to be an evil, a real evil. You have to have a real evil running through your veins to be able to repeatedly stab someone, seeing them in pain and the pain on their faces and the squirming of their body. Did will you just keep going? You know, like, oh my God. You see, but see, this is what's funny to me is how you said you have to be a real evil. Per- That's how they know that it's someone that knows them. The police, when you see someone that's over and over like that, like this, that's from anger. That's from, that's a personal anger. Not, I want to kill you because I want to take what's yours. That's a different kind of, that's a different kind of anger. 
You have to have a different kind. That, that that's controlled anger. You you're gonna. You, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Ra- I'm gonna stab you, and I'm gonna take what's yours. But what's the difference between? Because I'm sure there's just some sick out there who stab oh, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then my question is, well, what's the difference between the person that knows you that does that versus the sick that does that? Because aren't both people sick? Yeah. Like, but but what it is is one person is 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 so mentally ill or a psychopath that they 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 that's the they have that ability to do that but what it is when uh someone that loves you or hates you but love hates you that they you take them to the you take them they i shouldn't say that they've taken themselves to the extreme where they have they feel that same thing that a psychopath is where they just they're getting that rage out they're just taking it out on you they say they say when those the, the, the murders of these passion the murders of passion murders of uh of, of a husband that they're brutal and bloody and because th- that's where all the anger all the rage and once that first you know you're taking that person out and everything that you felt everything that you've had for whatever amount of years comes out and how you what you do next mm. You know, you use the proper word here, and, and, and I know sometimes comedically I throw this word around to be funny, but there are other times when I'm saying it, and I mean it. Cunt. Dude, when they, one of the cuntiest things she did that pissed me off was when they showed her on the secret camera footage that they set up, ripping the posters down. Uh, like, police put up any information leading to her husband's killer, call us it. When they show her, the way she rips the posters down, with such venom. And that's one of the red flags that made the police go, okay, we need to be looking at her different because wouldn't you want the killer of your husband to be found? Yeah. And her excuse was, it's bad for business because you're hanging him up near the business, the coffee shop, and it's just bad for business. And even the cop goes, How, isn't your husband's killer being found more important than the business? business? Yeah. So I'm sorry to keep beating the dead horse, but... The through line seems to be these criminals give themselves away. They do things to incriminate themselves. I know the detectives are smart. And again, the instinct and the intellect. But damn, these some dumb motherfuckers. No, but everybody everybody has these tells. Everybody gives away. No one can keep all this within them without giving any tells away. That's how people play. I mean, I'm, I'm not relating it to the same thing, but yes, we all have tells. We can't help it. Uh, when you play cards, one of the things in poker is to watch the other person, and people have little things that they do that they don't even realize that they're doing. And that's how you can find, that's how you find out their, the, the, that's how you can turn it to, that you can see them from a different place, and then you can figure them out. But she was, she was exceptional because, but he, this is what's weird about this, their relationship too. And the father says this. The father says, why didn't he tell me? Why didn't he let me know that there was a problem? I had no idea. He had no idea that he wanted this that that this divorce. There was it was friends that they had he had talked to that and maybe they don't even say how many or one. Maybe he confided in one other person that this relationship is just not what he wanted it, what he was hoping for. Right. Uh what he needed it to be in life. And it seems like and the reason I use the word cunt too is because that's what he calls her when they when they when she slams down the phone. The last fight that someone overheard that night is when he calls her. When the husband goes, You and slams down the phone. Right. So uh she's just uh but as as you as you get more into this, and then the brother, and the brother's this other person that I can't figure this dude out at all. That right. was so how, how do you how do you get brought into a business that you have nothing to do with, and then you're mad at the guy that? that well, he had problems. He had temperamental problems, right? Yeah, he had attitude problems. Problems with authority. Because uh, here, someone is giving you an opportunity to get into a business that you probably have no other chance of being. Right. But that's not how it worked out. Uh, something funny you said at the airport. Oh yeah, because the dad. <laughs> yeah, the, go ahead. the dad was amazing. The dad in this it was amazing because what they talk about in this and, and her hatred for the dad, uh, the killer, the the hatred for him is he never gave up in the whole all these years. He called the police every, and it was over ten years, twenty three to be exact. Yeah, every single day would call the police. Every day would call every, and they would say, hey. We'll call you when we're, when we're, and let you know when we hit the wall. Like we, we'll, we'll let you know that we can't go any further. We'll, we'll tell you. And it didn't make a difference. They told him. And he still called every day. And then Aries asked me. I said, uh, and I go, because I know the relationship, special relationship. 
did you have with your sons? And I said, well, what would you have done? And he goes, I'd have called, but I don't know every day. Every day? I don't, every day? That's a lot of days. You don't think you get busy one day and miss a day? Oh, my every God. Every day. You know what's funny about that, man? And it's, it's the little slice of truth in life. There are some, like the dad in this, who will do that. And there are some who, for lack of better words, move on. Yeah, because you, you, you want to continue with your life. You can't stop life. And I, I, I would always want to... I, if I, if I, the thing is, though, too, and this is also about the dad, he knew that it was them. He knew he, he was sure it was them. They, 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 right. Because the police said, we, just don't, we can't prove it's them, but we're sure it's them. Right. So every day he's looking for new evidence. And every day I think if I knew the who, that who did it, yeah, I, I'm going to call. I'm going to be a, a pass. But, but I got to be honest, every day, it's my son. And every day, I could I could echo that back to you as though you're somewhere where there's an echo. They're your sons. Every day, not every day. No, not every day. Every day, oh, some I love that. life life doesn't life continue to move on, and you have to take. You have other people in your life that are concerned as well. I know it only takes a few minutes to make a phone call, but some uh, on the other uh, someone else in your family's birthday, you're not gonna like put them. Uh, you know, put them into a place where you're gonna make sure that you are are. Are taking care of that person too? I don't know. Every day is a lot. I, I, when I, when he said, when they said that, and the police is like, every day, and they're making this face like every day he's calling, right. and that's one of the reasons they got to the conclusion of this case. But I mean, honestly, for I, I love my son. I love both my boys. I, 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 I love Tara. But every day, that, you know, it'd be crazy if your boys went missing, and they was missing for like eight years, and finally they resurfaced, and. They go, Dad, didn't you try to look for us? And you're just like, yeah, but not every day. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there are so many cunty moments. And I know some women get Ugh, cringe when they hear that word. But this woman deserves it. Because there's so many moments that are just... That it, what, part of what helped them seal this case was they brought in the babysitter from back in the day. And she's damn near like a full-grown woman now. And they interview her. And she talks about the moment where... She's talking to the, the, the wife and she's saying, basically asking her, when are you coming home? And she says, the wife, we're not done here yet. Yeah. The night of the murder. So she's saying to the babysitter, we're not done here in reference to, of course, not letting her know that. But yeah, we're busy killing my husband. Yeah. And, and wow. He, she leaves a message on the machine. Yes. I was going to ask you, was the message too detailed? Yes, way too detailed. But you're trying to cover your tracks. You're trying to put everything on there. This is why I say, you know, everybody, and this is also another sign of a control person. She's trying to put everything down. She's trying to control every situation. She's looked at it, and she's controlled every situation. But then when the cops look at it, they go, why is everything in the situation here like this laid out like this? Because it doesn't make any sense. That's not how you talk to people. Mm. And... You know, she was just laying out her alibi. It, it's disgusting, though. Uh, because, and I think this is the reason I hate her so much. Because they do have a kid. They Rightly had, so. They had a kid, and you know, I, I obviously I, I have my two boys, and they're from a, a previous marriage. And my, uh, you know, we didn't get along. That's why we got divorced, right? But. For the sake of our our kids, our our for these people that we we created. We didn't put it on them. Like, we wanted to still be able to parent the best we could. Yeah, there's tensions. Yeah, there's problems. Yeah, but you try to keep that away from, uh, I, I guess she did keep it away from her kid in a way. Uh, uh, but I mean, uh, uh, but, I, but I mean, we wanted the other person. I, I didn't want them not to have a relationship with their mom. She didn't want them not to have a relationship. This lady was just to remove him Com completely, not only to remove him completely, remove his family from him, from the the child completely. This is going to bleed into my next to last note. Um, dude, there's at least five moments with this woman. So again, this is rightly deserved. A full house. The full house. So this might be the cuntiest of them, of them all. The saddest part about it is when they show the early pictures of, again, the dad, the grandson, and uh, the grandfather, you could see that this was a unit. That this was this was if this was allowed to continue to grow the way it was growing, these three were going to be inseparable. And so basically, once this whole thing goes down, 
Flash forward to 23 years later, the son has grown, but apparently whatever lies he's been fed by the mom and the uncle, he no longer has a relationship with the grandfather at all. And finally, when the grandfather sees him for the first time at the trial, the grandson refuses to look at him, refuses to acknowledge him. Then when he gets up to say his uh, two cents after the, uh, the, the sentencing, he asks for leniency towards the mom. I'm sitting here going, how do you still believe this when all this evidence has been laid out that your mother and your uncle killed your dad? This is all he knows. This That's all no, he knows. Come yeah. on. This is all he knows. And she and she has given him a reason why this has happened his whole life. And and she has a completely different story. So him. as much as and they, and they said early on when he was a kid, his his relationship with his dad was so strong that when his dad didn't come home that night, obviously because he was killed, and once it, his dad it was obvious his dad was missing and he found out his dad was dead, it devastated him. He wasn't the same. So I'm going at no point. Does a part of you go, hey, mom, I want to talk to you. What's this I'm hearing? What's this at the trial they said? You don't quit. You're that lost that you just. Yeah, because I'm sure mom, the mom has told him forever. We didn't do it. They've said, and your grandfather's trying to get us in trouble because he's trying to hide from the facts of what really happened. And someone else broke in and we would never do this. And uh, listen to the tape and all. Yeah, she's laid it out. She's already made her alibi for him so that he has to believe her because everything that he's known from the time that his dad passed to that day he would have to break all of that away to do to understand what's happened he's had all those years the 20 years of of living with her idea of what it was that she stuck with that he's that built his life his whole life falls apart when he when he takes that away if he is that gullible uh, behind some a la his mother, he is going to be uh, whipped forever. Because the first woman that gets in his life that gives him a strong piece of and he's that gullible, he, he's going to have nothing but problems. I think that he, he it's something that you can't expect him to just turn and go, okay, everything I've been told, everything that I believed for the last 20 some, 25 plus years is a lie. I think it would take time for that to get fixed. I don't think that it happens right there. And then she did raise you. She did provide you with whatever life that he had. And they said it was a good life. He sent her to, they sent him to good schools and he did everything that he was. And so you're, you're, you have to, you have to make that mental change. I don't think you can just collapse it like that. I think that you have to, he's going to need a lot of therapy and a lot of time to change. I like how the sister of Howard said, they got away with murder for 23 years, so they should get locked up for 23 years, yeah. which is what they got. And then one cop goes, and at their age, that's a life, life sentence. Yeah. Uh, and I said, man, if that ain't karma, I don't know what is. Oh, it could be God, though. See, and this is why I struggle. It, that's this why. is why I struggle. Because there are times where I go, makes sense. Then there are times when I go, this is absurd. So that's my struggle. Last episode. Uh, a serial killer targeting young victims in East Harlem invades police until details connected to crimes from years earlier emerge. Again, Detective Mooney, he, they said he worked in Spanish Harlem for so long. And this is what's interesting when you always talk about policing and the community. This to me, and you get the genuine feeling that Mooney cares. This is what I liked about Mooney. Yeah. Because there was a moment where, I forget what the other case was, but in the moment where he kind of teared up a little bit. But he took the time to learn Spanish. Well, not only that, when he describes Spanish Harlem. Yeah. How did he describe it? Oh, it's vibrant and beautiful and the colors and the music and the people. How would, how would a cop describe, how, how, would, how would you expect a cop to describe Spanish Harlem to you today? Oh, man, them rice eating. Honestly, I mean, I'm just saying right. he, he, a noodle he, listening. he was part of the community, so he saw the beauty in the community over the over whatever whatever crime or whatever problems. Uh, every community has problems, but he saw the beauty of the community, and that's what happens when you when you become part of the community. You see things in a different way, and this is where I, why. And to be able to speak the language, to relate to the community, have the community feel like you're a part. Oh, he learns. He knows uh, how we. Wow. So, uh, but what was funny was they were talking about how 
uh, because he he knew Spanish, there would be times when he'd have perps in the back of the car, and they'd start talking to them, talking to each other in Spanish, um, uh, talking about where they hid the gun, what, what the, the crime, drugs like, the money, and he's just listening, thinking they think they don't know that he understands them, and you just gave yourself away. God damn it! Shut the. F you know what? This episode should be called STFU. <laughs> Shut the f up. Because in every one of these cases, if criminals would learn to be quiet, it's the reason why their lawyers say, your lawyer tells you, don't say nothing without me present. Well, Because you give yourself away. That's exactly what you're supposed to do, though. You're supposed to just say, I, I, I just get my lawyer. And then you, they, they, they said, there's, they, they said this thing like three times. They don't even call your attention to it, but they say it three times. He wow. said, yeah, we didn't have the opportunity to uh, interview him. And we need that opportunity so that we can get information. But we didn't have that opportunity because he, he requested a lawyer. Right. So what they're, they, they have admitted that's what you're supposed to do. But everybody wants to unburden themselves. And everybody feels that they can, they can tell you and make you empathetic to their situation. And you'll understand. And they'll, they'll, they'll be in a better position. There were several moments in this where the cops would go. We would talk to them. And if... As they're behind the the, the mirror that you see yeah. on all the cop shows, other cops are watching other cops interview them, and when they could kind of feel like the interview wasn't going their way, they would strategically come out, and another cop would go in purposely because they felt this cop could soothe their tensions and talk to them a certain way and get the information. Dude, I'm telling you, maybe it's because I've just seen too many of these shows. You stop with the tricks. I know this is, what, this is what this is. These are cop tricks. The classic good cop, bad cop. I'm not talking to you. That's the, I'm not talking to you. That's what you're supposed to say. Um, no, I, and, and when I say that, I mean this in... in I, I'm trying to be sincere. I'm not trying to say this. I know you're saying it is if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're doing a crime, don't talk to the guy. In... in there's the, the... In the one before this, uh, the episode with, that, we, uh, that I would like to call... The, the cunt episode. We got several good names for this. Yeah. Uh, in that episode, the um, the babysitter uh, wasn't living uh, and had left the country to work as, a, I, I don't know what she was working. She was working outside the country. She came back and the police wanted to interview her and she said, okay. And then they met her and she had her lawyer with her. Right. She didn't do anything wrong. Uh, she just knew as, as a human being that the people are going to ask you questions and to make sure that you uh, don't put yourself in any kind of jeopardy. Because you don't know what uh, the intent of the people that are interviewing are. The people that are interviewing, they have their own agenda. And you bring a lawyer to make sure that your agenda matches their, their agenda. Right. And that it's not going to sideline you or put you in a bad position. So even her bringing that, and they said, oh, what's this? Why would she do this? But there was no animosity towards that she did it. She did the right thing for her, which was to, you always should be protecting yourself. So when you have an issue and you you should have representation. To skip back just one beat, uh, with the two teenagers, I never heard of that thing, Queen for a Day. Yeah. Where, and, and because her dad had so much money, he hired one of the best top lawyers in the city. This guy was like a f uh, Johnny Cochran. But... When, they, when she went in for the queen for a day, he didn't go. He sent a, a way low, lower level attorney on his behalf, and that's when she f***ed herself. Yeah. But let me, let me get back to yeah. this one. So on this one, basically, there's this guy who's raping and murdering, a serial murder rapist, young girls, uh, all within the ages of 15 yeah. to 17 or something like that. Um, so... And, you know, he even, one girl, he even burned on the roof. He set on fire. Uh, and I just said, man, I truly believe if you, if a loved one of yours is murdered as a tax-paying citizen, you should be allowed to beat the perpetrator up for three minutes. That, to me, is justice. And on top of the sentencing and the going to jail. I, I just, because when they talked about the one Hispanic girl, um, I probably should have wrote her name down, Paolo or something like Paolo. that. Paolo. And you just see the footage, the video footage of her playing in the snow. And I just, again, as a, as a dad with daughters, especially my youngest, <coughs> I'd lose my mind, man. And there are several moments like where Howard's father 
had said, I could just imagine the, how scared he was. The brother of the lady in the vent, I could just imagine how scared. That to me, and I've said that when we did the interview with the preacher, the, the terror, the thought of their terror is what breaks me down. To, to know that you're going through terror and your life is being taken from you and no one is helping you, especially the people that you call on. So I, I just, I, I think you should be able, like a purge, you got to be able to put your hands on a motherfucker. And I know they say, you know, that won't bring your kid back. Just like that, the saying, money don't buy happiness. I disagree with that saying, too. It may not bring my kid back, but it's got to give me something. Well, it's, what it gives you is that you know it's not going to happen to anybody else's kid. No, f- that. What it's going to give me is I want to put you through the kind of pain you put my loved one through. I don't, I'm not saying I don't give a about it not happening to another kid because that is a good thing. But I want you to feel what you may have feel, my kid feel, my, my loved one feel. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah, but it, when people say it doesn't bring your kid back, it, it just takes you to that person's level. Ah, so what? I'm, I'm not trying to say one way or the other. I'm just saying that's what it does, though. Match your comp- you, you, you play to your competition. Mm-hmm. Um. And, you know, it's funny, uh, my last two notes, and then we're done. Uh, it, the, the funny thing was, it's crazy, because some of these criminals, man, as, as brutal and as f***ed up as they are, and even the cops have said this, show a high level of intelligence. Like, there were moments where I, when I watched the Ted Bundy thing, where they were like, yo, he was a smart guy. They talked about this guy. They talked about how the way they got his DNA, because they had set up a camera, and they were following him. And they put a camera on top of a door sill where he would constantly, in his apartment building, enter so they could see when he would leave and come and go and follow him. At one point, he got wind that it was a camera, and he removed the camera. He knew it was there the whole time. Right. They, they said that he just was, he was very aware of what was going on. And I love how they do get Are you going to get to how they he do did, Yeah, how they do get him is uh, he's locked up, and as they feed the prisoners, uh, he, he took a drink from a cup. So they said that uh, I guess one of the cops went to one of the guards and said, give me all the cups from all the people. And they didn't find the DNA. But so with the they d- found it, but it wasn't in the in, 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 in the, the cup that they thought was his. So they found out that he basically went to an inmate. He was making so much noise. He kept banging on his cell that the one inmate next to him was like, dude, what can I get you to do to shut the fuck up? Stop this noise. He goes, hey, let me drink. Let me borrow your cup. Let me have your cup. Switch cups. With me. Switch cups with me. So they switch cups, and that's why they couldn't, but then they found out. So I'm just going, again, I, it's, it's almost like in the movie Bronx Tale when, when, when De Niro says to his kid, the, the, the worst thing in life is wasted talent. Like, if you're smart, you got a talent, man, and that's what you choose to do? Yeah, but he also had, he, he said to, to his girlfriend at the time, that there's something wrong. Like I have a sickness. Like I can't stop it. Like he he knew that he had a problem. Right. Listen, there, there's smart people who do this. You brought up Bundy, but this guy, this guy in particular too. You don't kill people as long as they kill and as many people as they kill and get away with right. it. If you're not smart, and I'm not saying that's it's, it's a good use of your smartness. I'm just saying no. <clears throat> there are smart people because the other thing you're saying is don't say anything. That, and you're talking about the dumb things that that uh, criminals do. Mm-hmm. Uh. Criminals have to be 100% perfect not to get caught. Right. They only have to f*** up once. Right. So it's hard. You think about everything you do. Uh, to think about your night. You f*** up a joke every night. You, every night you, I should have said it a little bit like this. Or I should right. have done. That, that's, that's, that's their life. But one, one misstep puts them in prison or, right. uh, or, or uh, a lethal injection. Right. So th- they can be smart. But they can't make any mistakes. There's no, there's no margin for error in that in, in what they're doing. So there, are, there are some very smart criminals. You just th- these these people are not, they're not. It's not all passion. It's not easy. These the police that you said played to the level of their competition. That's why these these detectives that we're looking at, they're smart. They're 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 at that level. They have, but that's they're smart. But they get a lot of help from dumb criminals. Yes, they do get help. But but to have to go there. You know, when you say play to the level of your competition, these 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 detectives, they have to go there mentally. They have to go there to be able to catch these guys. They have to think like them in, in aspects. They, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough job. You know, last thing. Um, <clears throat> so how they finally get this dude is once they put him in an interrogation room, the one cop is trying to get him to talk. 
but the dude's not giving up nothing. So at one point, the guy's actual girlfriend goes in and they, and they, and they say, she says to him, boo, what did you do? And that's when he spills his guts. And I'm going, okay, so you know you're in the interrogation room. You, you purposely are not talking to the cops so you don't incriminate yourself. Your girlfriend comes in, and because it's her, you spill your guts. But you're in the interrogation room. You're in the room with the glass. Have you not watched Law & Order? Have you not seen First 48? You know there's somebody on the other side watching you and listening. Yeah, but see, this is the, this is the funny thing about this guy. And this is, what, this is where this is the, the details. When they talk about him, when they arrest him in Miami, he leaves New York, goes to Miami. They arrest him in Miami and they bring him out and he's crying and he looks at the, the, the guy and he says, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the, there's different parts of this guy. There's the part that the, the guy that knows that he's a horrible right. he, and he doesn't want to do these things. And when he breaks down, he cries and he's he's remorseful for it. The other part where the cops interrogate and he's like, I ain't saying anything. He doesn't right. say anything. But when the girl came in, it broke him again. It made him cry. He started crying. She, he said he cried and then he told his girl everything. There's the two parts to that guy. And then remember, the female detective goes, can I get a piece of your DNA? Pull his hair. He goes, do what you got to do, ma'am. Uh, okay. Well, they're yeah. going to get it anyway. Right. So, it's, you, but you, you can, once you're caught, you know, you're caught, you're caught, man. You know, you could try to get away with it. I don't know. I, 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 I understand what you're saying, but there's, there's moments when you know that you're, you're caught. Well, I'm going to tell you something. As a mastermind criminal, criminal I'm 49, uh, and I've been getting away with giving bad for at least 28 years. <laughs> so I don't know what the slip is going to be for me, but I've been getting away with giving away trash for over two decades. Now, see, this is where Nary could have got you. Yeah. When you are famous, you can give away some trash <laughs> right. because they got the famous. They didn't right. care. They weren't looking for the, the. And if it's really trash, they got the infamous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, folks, that's it. Before you give out the dates, I'm very excited because I want to say this. Uh, next week, we'll be in Aries. Do you need anything? When you hear the next podcast, we'll be in Cleveland. Annie and I are. I've already watched it. We're going to be discussing, so I'm giving you guys a heads up. Relax, get to it, something, something, we do it. Wham! There's a Netflix special on Wham! This was a good one, man. I can't wait till you watch this. I want to talk about this. Uh, I'm glad you. I'm glad you're ready for it. Music all day long. I'm gonna download that. You know how sometimes we talk about certain. Musically, uh, and I download it. I'm downloading Wham, son. Dude, George Michael could sing, man. Until it was a night where I could touch your body, and not everybody got a body like you, baby. I love that song. Yeah, but how did you feel about? Uh, I haven't seen it. I know you already seen it. So since we're doing a little highlight part, did you do you not feel for Andy, Andy Ridgely at all? Like he, the other dude, yeah. I think he was just as important to the success of that group. Okay. We'll, we'll leave it there then. For, okay. for but this. but don't get it twisted. George Michael was the Beyonce. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, well, I, I don't know what they went into with him, but I know some of the things that happened with him, too. The, the good things that has happened for Ridgely. So. This is um, called Hollywood. Damn, why am I saying? You know why I'm saying that? DJ Who Kid. I did some shit with him back in New York uh, in the mid-'90s. Uh, where we did, I did some impressions. Basically, his mixtape was called Hollywood Homicide. And I did a bunch of impressions on that mixtape. So that's why I keep saying Hollywood. Homicide New York, Netflix. This is what this is called, what we just talked about. Five episodes, about 48 minutes apiece. Fantastic. All right, guys. I know you're listening to this right now. It is uh, Wednesday, the 17th, or later. But we're going to be, I said, I already told you this, we're going to be at the Cleveland Improv uh, Friday, the 19th through Sunday, the 21st of April, followed by, guys, in Canada, we're back up there. We're going to be uh, Saturday, the 27th of April at the Bronson Center Theater in Ottawa, uh, followed by the Olympia in Montreal. That's the 28th, Sunday of April. And then we're going to be in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, at the Bella Rose Arts Center on Tuesday, the 30th of April. And then we're back in the States, guys. Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia, 
Portland, Helium. We're going to be back out uh, the 2nd through the 5th of May. And then we're going to be at the Meyer Theater in Green Bay, Wisconsin on May 9th, Thursday. Uh, when uh, Saturday, the 11th of May, we'll be at the Wilbur in Boston. And then we'll be at the Hulu Center in Madison Square Garden, May 18th. That's a Saturday. Get those tickets. Uh, followed by Funny Bone, Richmond, Virginia, uh, the 24th, Friday, May. And, oh, that goes through uh, Sunday the 26th. Uh, then... Last one I'm going to give for this month because it's the end of May is uh, Come off in the, the frame hook. so they can see a pretty face. Bro. Off the hook at Naples, Flo- in Naples, Florida, where I'm gonna be in Naples, and that's uh, May 30th through uh, Sunday the second. Dude, prior to Cleveland, I am going to eat nothing but beans, so that at one point while I'm on stage, the audience won't know what it means, but I'm gonna rip a fart that makes the sound of a Tommy gun. <laughs> And I'm going to say Cleveland just a bit outside <laughs> on stage. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Yes. All right. Is that a show? That is a goddamn show. There we go. Spears and Steinberg. Thanks for listening to the Spears and Steinberg podcast. If you'd like to know who's responsible for this show, it was hosted by Ari Spears and Andy Steinberg, produced by Steve Merrick and Anthony Holmes, executive producer Big Papa, Robert Kelly, and Matt Pine Schmidt for the Laugh Button Podcast. For more information on where to find us on the internet, visit SpearsbergPod.com.